even before I went to, to Egypt. And I've been grateful to the brother ever since. He has done a magnificent job in terms of doing that research. He continues to amaze me with his productivity. You all know that he is a psychiatrist with an Afrocentric perspective and dedication. So without further ado, permit me to bring to the microphone Brother Richard Kidd. drummer, Brother Joseph, and, and, and Dr. John Cazell, and then with the prelude, the most excellent presentation, the most excellent presentation by Dr. Charles Finch, an attempt will be made on my part to uh, approach the question of inside the black dot. Dr. Finch has already given a historical overview of great magnitude. He has made known that from a common root that is millions of years old, the entire human family originated and grew in an African cradle over a period of four million, some say as much as eight, some will even say many as 12 million years. And just in the last million years did those people who we call the Ainu some also call the Twa, migrate to the other continents. Did migrate to the other continents around the globe. In the course of that migration, the cradle, if you will, the planet, was itself going through a period of growth and development. In concert with a family of other planets, or what you will, stellar bodies, called the Pleiades system, P-L-A-E-I-D-S, a system composed of a total of seven suns that could be observed to hold the North Pole star position for a period of basically 2,500 some odd years. Africans kept detailed record because they noticed that our sun moved around this central Pleiades system, star family if you will, and our sun took 25,000 years roughly to make one complete orbit around its sisters and brothers. As it did so, they noticed that the Earth changed in its tilt as a result of the effects of the play of gravitation from one brother's son, or just a son, upon the other. And that there were great alterations in climate. There were great winters that would last this was on top of the background ice age. There were accentuations of ice ages. There were great winters that would last roughly 6,000 years. Great spring, 6,000 years. In other words, Africans planned their migrations from the common homeland by observing the clock. They observed the clock. They observed the movement of when did these stars change their position and they could, then, they could then exactly determine where was our sun in this great circle of the clock of 25,000 years. So they could say, well, it's time to go because the ice is coming. So a question does arise for those folks who did not go. 
Were they people who were forced to stay? Was it an accident? An illusion is given that these were very so-called primitive times. Primitive mean that they had no communication between continents. That people were walking on foot. Now there are great problems in terms of excavation because we have not excavated the entire planet. And the places that used to be the big time cities are largely underwater. Because as, you, as the surface has been moved about as Teutonic plates have moved, what is now on the surface used to be underground. What is now underground used to be on the surface. In other words, the things shift in a great cycle as the, as the planet recycles its surface. Just as we recycle our skin, the planet's skin is recycled. So it's kind of hard to know what is in that regard. So we can't say we have a lot of factual information. And I would dare say even if we had factual things we could put our hands on, the current culture that wants people to quote to worship only them as the most powerful ones would certainly not want that information to get out. <laughs> That's not conducive to mental slavery. That's not conducive to painting myself as the God type. That's not conducive to making mama and daddy serve me if they realize how old they are. Not conducive. But I'm saying all that to say that in this 25,000 years of this great cycle, there were changes that did take place. In the ice ages, some say 2 million years, some say in the past 5 million years, some say it's been an ongoing thing. But there has been a, a gradual cooling of the planet. But when we look back, at a more distant time, we can look back at 11,000 BC and we can say, well, was there a place known Atlantis? So, oh, that's pseudoscience. Was Al Kabulon, the, the continent of Africa, actually Atlantis itself? Who knows? But the critical thing, some would say that when we talk about these catastrophic events, Africans had a clear concept of what it meant. In the works, of Plato, he did cite an example in which Solon, a Greek who had visited Kemet, and Solon is falsely credited as being the one who brought the concept of democracy to Athens. But that does not compute since Athens was founded by Egyptians. That does not compute since Democratic principles were well underway in Uganda well before Socrates in 500 BC. And certainly were in place at the time when Socrates did pass through in 500 BC. But notice what it said. So here's Solon, he walks up into the African, he walks into the African uh, 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 temple or scientific institution. 500 BC places us where? 500 BC means it's shortly after the Persians in 525 BC had taken hold. When the, the advancing deserts had denuded North Africa and there was a gradual decrease in the abundance of food sources and the competition among Africans. And we also at 525 BC, finally, Africans had begun to allow Greeks to be mercenaries in their armies even prior to that. And the result of that, of course, the Persians came in and took over the whole thing. But at that time, the Greeks had come in, because a little bit prior to that time, the Greek could not even come into Egypt. They were done what? If they had red hair, they were sacrificed on spot. You know what I'm saying by sacrifice? Mm -hmm. and, and that was the result of what? Because he had earlier confrontation with pirates. Who were pirates? Well, the Ninth Dynasty was said these were lowly, miserable Asiatics who were paranoid and hungry all the time, who came out of the mountaintops during the Ice Age. That's the Margaret Lightman, ancient Egyptian literature, published at UCLA Press. That you can get today in Dallas. You might be able to get one of these little, uh, with one of our book vendors when you leave this room today. But notice, Solon was bragging, saying, oh, I come from an old people. 
And then the brothers looked at him like, oh man, here we go again. Otherwise, the insecurity when present among people that you know, you may not even know who they are, but you can sense that they know something that you don't know. So finally, the oldest one, who would be the uh, high priest, stands up and says, Solon, Solon, you Greeks are nothing but children. I'm just paraphrasing it. He says, you don't, you don't even know who was there in Greece before you came then. Number one. Number two, if there's been anything great done on this entire planet, we have long since consigned it to our libraries. Which means what? The keeping of records. The accumulation of wisdom for study and reflection and review. And so you can then add it to your internal library. So they, quote, put Solon in his place. They called him a child. But as child suggest, that you have not learned how to control and, and master your vehicle. You don't know who you are, and you haven't made up a, a, a decision as to what you're going to do with yourself. And you're jumping in these rooms inside of your head and don't even know who's in there. And you are a child, and therefore doing childish things. We call, we have another name for childish behavior, which is called racism. We have another name for childish behavior, which is called demonic attitudes. In other words, what possesses a person when they are in a certain state and they are weak of will and they develop a line of communication with another entity in another realm, and the entity, entity takes over. We understand, to some degree, Adolf Hitler and the, and the predilection of what it's about. We understand the Pole Valley mentality. We understand that all too well. We understand why was it that during the so-called Renaissance period that they had, that they, in Europe, over 11 million white females were burned at the stake. We understand that when that ceased in, 14, in the 1490s, that the fixation was transferred to burning who else? So what is the connection between being against my own right brain and then also equating my right brain or my feminine, not sexuality, but equating my, quote, way of the heart with Africanity? What is the connection between feelings, intuitions, and the African way, the symbolic mind? Those are important questions. But I'm just saying all that to say this, that as we approach this question, when the Ice Age came down, somebody lost their eye of inner vision. Now they may have lost it even prior to that, and that's why they couldn't come home. It was not a voluntary thing about staying up home. In certain traditions, they, certain current traditions, there's a thing called the cable toe. When they're led across the desert and, quote, stay on the other side of the desert. I won't identify the tradition. But the thing to be considered is that Africans did go through a great schism, and during the Old Kingdom, which ended with the intermediate phase, and then the Middle Kingdom, another intermediate phase, and the New Kingdom, another intermediate phase, every one of those great kingdom epics ended with the invasions of children. They ended with the invasion of children, you would say when Africans were weak, and I would say when Africans had gone to sleep. When they lost a sense of who they were, and did not educate their children. And very, very importantly, when the brothers and sisters began to not deal with each other. That's the foundation. Mm -hmm. So how do we get in the black dot? It takes two to tangle. Mm -hmm. It takes two to walk in the black dot. Could you imagine a brother standing in front of a sister and they're facing each other and the brother has a mirror up looking at the back of her head and she has a mirror looking at the back of his head. And she sees a reflection of herself. He sees a reflection of himself. She can see what he can't see. He can see what she can't see. I cannot see the back of my head. But that's where my other side is. Whatever, now Sigmund Freud discovered this in his works. Carl Jung discovered this in his works. That when you 
had a dream, there was a doorway that led you to be able to converse with the dream world. Whatever your physical body is, it would appear in a, the sex type that was opposite to your physical body. Your soul, if I'm a man, my soul would appear in the form of a show sure enough fine sister. <laughs> Question is, how can I dialogue with her? How can I become intimate? How can we have an equality relationship in which we are united as one? How can I find, on, my, on a personal level, my craft, as a brother told me, remind me the other day, but how can I find my other half? That's real. That soulmate talk is real. It's not just hustle rap. It's real, real stuff. So that inside the black dot, to some degree, means having to identify who that soul type is in your own <coughs> inner mind. And then being able to have a relationship with it. And knowing, have you ever had, a, have you ever had those kind of dreams where when you go to sleep at night, you suddenly see in your dream three or four past loved ones who you used to date or used to be with. You say, why did I dream about boyfriend one, two, or three? Or sometimes husband one, two, or three. In the same night. Well, you don't have a boyfriend who has three faces or a girlfriend with three faces, but those three different people had caught different pieces of your soul type. If you look at it close, you'll find a common thread in all three. Well, so-and-so had big arms, yeah, and it was so-and-so sensitive and caring. Well, so-and-so encouraged me to study. Yes. Oh, well, there are different aspects of that soul type. It shows up in soul image. And so the question is, don't throw away all of them. Rem look closely and see what it is that they did that really worked. Really brought you out. Brought something in you out. So that, again, Solon was a child. Solon, as the Greeks approached it, had grave difficulty in relating to their women. Why? Shagat and Diopis say that in the two cradle theory, as, as Dr. Leonard Jeffries may have a chance to share with us at some point in these discussions, as Dr. Leonard Jeffries translated Shagat and Diopis' work from civilization to barbarism and other works, that Diop had seen that there was a two cradle mechanism. That in the southern cradle, there were the Africans who had a system that was based upon the woman having the property rights of inheritance. You had to be, if you wanted to be Pharaoh, you had to marry the queen. She had the rights of inheritance. But very importantly, because the African woman brought in so much revenue, she lived in a place where there's an abundance of food sources, and in a so-called hunter-gathering society, where the woman can, quote, carry her children with her and to attend to the crops at the same time, she could bring in 85% of the food. Now, when y'all bring 85% of the food, you do command respect. Because <laughs> I, I know from experience, <laughs> beyond the book, when you bring it in, you do command, well, brother, no, you not dealing this out like I want to deal it out, please. Give me some respect. But yet, in the, so in the matriarchal culture, not a domineering culture, but one that would emphasize what? The feeling tone, way of the heart that her way was given credit to and value to. In the other culture, the so-called northern cradle patriarchal culture, where because of the ice age, most of the plants had been covered over with ice. The ground was frozen. You had to chase the herd. 90% of your food came from animal products. So strong muscles determined who brought home the meat. And also, the woman was left to take care of the ch children, and she was demoted, was called a vessel to bring in new children to help me to protect my flock. Not only was she brought in, brought down, but there is an inherent fear in facing your other cortex, shall we say. It hurts to learn that I, as a man who feel like I'm glorious in my logic, don't know jack crap about feelings. It hurts. 
for me to tell my wife, baby, I can feel it. Brother, I'll look at you before you even open your mouth. I knew you were lying. <laughs> and she put that feeling on x-ray on me. I said, oh, goodness, girl, what you doing? And it hurts sometimes for a sister to say, oh, I felt it, I felt it, but baby, did you pay the bill? <laughs> or did you don't, or did you think before you spoke? <laughs> Those are archetypal statements. That from the, from the northern cradle perspective, the males did not listen to their women. Still don't. And there's a fear. Because between the two, the logical side and the feeling tone side, Africans knew it was the feelings that was a deeper one. Because it's, it's, it's possible to have instantaneous access to the collective unconscious in which you could access the accumulated logical wisdom of any of your ancestors, human and otherwise. And you could do it as a flash of inspiration. How can we have people who are idiot savants who can stand in front of a freight train and watch it pass by a hundred cars long and then say, oops, two trillion, four hundred forty-nine billion, three hundred seventy-seven million and two. Add up all the numbers in an instant and in every other respect not even know how to read or write. There are human faculties that are far beyond what we, what we can see. But in long story it made short, in the northern cradle there was a demotion of the female there was a, a pushing up of the male, and there was flagrant non-heterosexual conduct. The epitome in Greece of romantic love was man to man. Say it like it is. If that happened to men, what happened to women? So these are conditions that evolve not only in those, there are also latencies that occur in any human, but without wisdom, of knowing where it's going to lead you, you can get caught in a trap and get tricked on the trick and turned out in a big trick. But there are all kind of possessional states to be aware of. So I'm just saying all this to say that inside the black dot does have an historical base to it and that when somebody else came home in a vengeful, jealous, greedy way, on a deeper level, they are also, this may sound kind of rough, coming home to destroy it, but then in a typical psychotic way, wanting to be healed. Mom and daddy, please save me, come and kill myself. And that's the soul crying. That's not the mind, that's the soul crying. But we understand today that no one can heal self but self. Africans have a tendency to be, to get, and, and they've, they've been gamed on and played on in terms of playing on the humanism, playing on the humanity, putting them to sleep, giving them the sweet talk. But you know, that's not so much true for a lot of brothers in this country because you all have been gained on so much, you're an automatic pilot of suspicion. You've got a healthy, healthy, conscious paranoia. That's reality focus. And you just, the antennas are always double check, triple check, can't trust it. <laughs> you know? So that's operating all, at all times for, for brothers in this country, in, in, this, in this particular domain. But as they approach this, we find that the, that the books were taken over, that, the, that the so, many of the sacred books were hidden. And I'm going to dwell a little bit for an example uh, with some of the sacred books. For example, if you lived in East India, during the time of the Aryan invasion that took place in India, and you were an indigenous person called a Dravidian, or the so and you were then demoted and called a untouchable. Those who invaded the so-called Aryans said that your shadow, black man of India, East Indian, Ethiopian, uh, Eastern Ethiopian, could not even fall on a Brahmin or an Aryan. If it did, you were to be slain. That you, black man in India, black woman in India, 1500, 2000 BC, who fell to the Aryans because you did not have walls around your cities. And we came in and just burned you up. That if you heard the Veda, the sacred works called the Veda, then you were to have molten lead poured in your ears. It was very easy for England to move in with racism into India because they had already, they had, they could, they could talk the English thing or two about racism. 
But to summarize this thing is to say also that in, in this culture, a large amount of the so-called sacred culture, a person will say, well, Dr. King, I'm going to come a Rosicrucian, or I'm going to join this new age group, this blah this or blah that. I think it has great value, but the racism is still rampant, utterly rampant. You can read Madame Helena Petrova Blavatsky. She will say that the Aryans were the red race. So, goodness, what's that all about? She would talk about black folks being the Lemurians. But she won't give up that she herself was black, Southern Russian. She won't give up that she studied first in Egypt, then in India, then in Tibet. Won't give that up. So these are important things to consider. You can study these so-called, some of the esoteric traditions, and you can even run across a thing called the, because many of them are structured after the Kabbalah, but they won't tell you that the Kabbalah came out of Egypt at the end of the 19th dynasty, and that it's patterned from the Book of the Cow and the Book of the Gates. You can go right to, and read Pionkanov's, you can read from the Book of the Gates and the Book of the Coming Forth by Day. You can read about it. It's, very, it's right there to be read. But you will read, if you read some of the Kabbalah statements, they will talk about, for example, that, Afri that if you, those who follow the cow must be killed. So they had organized another culture to take the information and to frame it according to their own needs. So that these, these questions of, of spirituality, and it is a thing that requires extremely exact study, extreme exact, as much time as you spend studying mathematics, you have to, you'd have to spend studying uh, certain aspects, I mean, of, of numerology, for example, certain aspects of sim symbolism, certain aspects of knowing how to construct certain domains to operate in. You have to know that in a very precise manner. And I would, I would clearly say, do not do it under no condition without a, a well-proven master. And a master that does not make you pay an arm and a leg for it, but a master approaches you out of service. Don't get caught by a hustler who wants to hook you in and then take your money or take your sex. I mean, one of the two. Or take something else, who knows. But don't get caught by that. But in this time of the move into the black dot, there has, uh, let me give you a little key symbols on the black dot. It relates to the concept of D. And using, I'm using the Kabbalah symbolism now, the Kabbalah belief, the Kabbalah orientation. It relates to the concept of D, which relates to the concept of Daleth, D-A-L-L-A-T-H, or the door. And it relates to the threshold of the door. If you go to Kemet, for example, and you walk into the door, say, in an in, in, in Abydos, from the outer courtyard to the inner courtyard, you can look down at the bottom lintel of the doorway and it's done in black rose granite. Black granite with flecks of red. The same stone that is used in the king's chamber for the walls and floor and ceiling. And it, I, I think part of it, I'm guessing, may symbolize that when something moves from the immaterial, from a, from a very fast rate of movement, vibratory rate, and slows down, take on a more, con a more dense matter state, in other words, the spirit impregnating dense matter, it's mainly a question of vibratory rate or speed, actually. That it then, that earth is seen as a fertilizing factor, but it, it comes out of something that is dark because you, with your physical concrete eyes, cannot see it and make sense out of it. You have to use something that you're, more than your logical mind, but you do have a feeling tone, intuitive mind that has a spirit and a soul and can sense beyond the flesh. And you can also develop instrumentation that is very exact along your spirit tone line that can sense beyond the flesh as well. So to summarize, we stand on the age of these students who are waking up. You are, we are the believers in dark, not dark, black science. Black meaning what? We believe, in the, we know the spirit. It can be quantitated. It is a lie that it cannot be spoken about in exact measurement term. That's a tale. We spoke about it in most exact ultimate terms. So we have a mission, and even those of us in the corporate world notice sometimes that we go there, we feel that our souls are being 
kind of coerced. And, and our mission is, is to, again, find out what, who you are on these multi-levels and what you're going to do about it <laughs> and how, how sweet do you want to let it flow? <laughs> do you want to let it be sweet <laughs> or just be all right? Or will it even let you rest? Do you, have, do you really have a choice in the matter? <laughs> do you have a choice in the matter? <laughs> how many headaches do you want to endure? <laughs> how, many, how many circles? <laughs> how, many, uh, how, many go, how many going around and around and around? Or do you want to just step on up? Sometimes you don't even have a choice. Thank you, my sisters and brothers, for your attention. Black male here at the City College of New York here in the boroughs uh, near the World Trade Center. It is being hosted by the many folks in this community, in particular Marvel King Production. So again, it's a pleasure to be a part of our people's holding forth on this very critical subject. And I'll try to share some thoughts with you today on the issues of Kim Ware, Melanin, and the Iron Peru. In particular, the issue of the pupil. Now this is the part two, seeing we had the same issue presented yesterday, but it will not be a repeat. Uh, it will be additional. So I'll try to just give a quick summary of some things that were presented yesterday, and at the same time try to uh, approach some things that were not presented yesterday. First, in a definition of the title, Kim, K-M, W.R., we have chalk today, so let me write this on the board. This word chem is a current day English uh, tr translation of a medjunetter, also known as hieroglyph. Shown in this fashion, in which a piece of wood was shown burnt on one end with a human person standing behind. This was the name for Kemet, or the word Kem, or the blackened wood, and the person would symbolize the land of the black people. When European Africans came across this Medjunetra for Kem, for, or for the name for the nation, what is known as Egypt, they mistranslated it to mean the land of the black soil. Of course, they wanted to whitenize Egypt because it would not fit their lie that was being passed off in the academic circles by which people felt justified to kill, rape, and maim our people to pay for 
their entire civilization, be it intellectual, be it material, be it spiritual, the rationalization was given that we are bringing them out of the jungle, we're giving them Christ. They're nothing but heathens. They're three-fifths of a human, so it's okay if you rape and maim them because they're only subhumans to begin with. You could not do that intellectually if that was seen as mother and father, if that was seen as the ones who inhabited the original Eden. You could not do that. But again, that's the lie. This lie was maintained in particular, it didn't just start with enslavement, as some would say. It did not start when slavery got off to a vigorous, a real big push uh, following 1492 with the opening up for the European, some European, should we say, of the so-called New World. It did not start with industrialization. This antagonism between the European African or as a so-called lowly Asiatic, had been present probably from the beginning in the, in, the, in the interaction between the Africans and their children. Because indeed, the European African is a children of his black parents. But with a different mindset, no doubt. But nonetheless, a child. Now, so this point is a very critical one to maintain if Kim represents blackness. If you burn wood, then you have, and what has happened, you've oxidized or you've burned off some of the other atoms and you end up with some atoms that cannot be burned at room temperature. And you reduce it down to its basic carbon compound. Carbon being an atom that is the basic living block of life. It is a basic living block of all matter that is called living. Now, from an African perspective, all things are some stage of life. But what we, what we commonly call those things that are moving fast enough for us to see it, then we call that life. Though a rock may be life waiting to be billions of years from now, since we can't wait a billion years, we may not give it value. But seeing a plant move as it grows, and seeing an animal form move as it grows, in both cases, their living chemical structure is composed of a carbon atom, and so we study, we call the study of living tissue, that is, so, and a certain kind of definition, animal matter and plant matter, organic chemistry. And organic chemistry is a study of those things that have the carbon atom as a major component of their nature. But if you look at the carbon atom in its physical state, and if you touch it, and when it's still in a kind of loose granular state, it is what you call soot. It's black. Just as black as you ever want to see. Why is it black? It is black because of its unique physical properties. It is able to bond with four different hydrogen atoms or other or or equivalents, and it forms a cube. It also can form chains, so-called benzene rings, and other, other things, long, it can be long chains and cubes, and it can also form a six-sided kind of shape as well. It also can form an, an, an icosahedron, the so-called Bucks Miniature Fuller type, almost like a circle, if you will, with many edges around it. That's, that's what it, it will do. This carbon atom is found in all living plants, in all animal forms on this planet. The carbon atom itself <coughs> is not made on this planet. The carbon atom is made as a result of the formation of main sequence st stars in space itself. That as a star forms from inner solar gas clouds, it will condense by the, by the function of gravity, pulling together these huge millions of light years across of inner solar gas clouds into a compact ball of interstellar gas that, depending upon its size, if it's large enough, the pressure weighing down upon the center will cause a nuclear furnace to ignite and it will burn away its contents as the heavy pressure weighs down upon above. And these stars will form and the initial uh, 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 atom being born is hydrogen and as the center of the star 
with this great pressure weighing upon it, will force atoms together in a fusion-type fashion, such that, such that the hydrogen atoms will then combine together to form now helium, in which you have two hydrogen atoms combined together, and then the hydrogen atoms, helium atoms will further combine together to form the next one, or an atom that has four, and you will begin to build up and have heavier weight atoms in the core of a star, and so that a certain stage is reached, and when a star goes to its first supernova explosion, where it blows away its outer shell, it blows away a carbon shell, black carbon, in space itself. And the black carbon will then seed the interstellar gas clouds millions of light years across. This happens throughout our galaxy and other observable galaxies throughout the known universe. So this black thing that we talk about Yes, it happened in Kemet. Yes, it happened on planet Earth. But it is a universal kind of issue that applies across time and space. No matter what lie is said about black, nature don't lie. And that's not the lie. That's not the truth that nature sees it, just, just the opposite. So as we see, for, I'm just trying to paint a picture again as we lead up to this question. As we see that the, the stars are born from interstellar gas clouds that often contain huge amounts of carbon-containing compounds, and they're just not simple carbon chain compounds. they are also carbon compounds that are some, sometimes very complex that have actually formed living tissue in space. Or complex organic molecules, some of them even looking like small bacteria in space itself. Space being alive. This outer, so that we have our own solar system, the so-called uh, Milky Way, and we're about at this range, about one-third of the way out in the, along the disk. It takes our sun and its planetary family 250,000 years to make one complete orbit perpendicular to the plane of the, of the, of the Milky Way. In this disk region is where we find the interstellar gas clouds, and this is where new star formation is taking place. And as it passes through this disk, the sun and who knows what else. It is shaped, the sun and its planetary family and moving through space looks like a giant sperm <laughs> with, the sun, with the sun at its head and the planets in its tail. And as it passes through this outer shell or covering of the sun and its planetary family is called the Oort Cloud. It is composed of large balls of ice that were there from the beginning of the formation of the planet of the Sun and planetary system about four and a half billion years old. And these large balls of ice will from time to time break away and then move into the interior of the Sun and planetary family, and that is what is called comets. The comets will melt upon being exposed to sunlight. And they will, but very important, this ball of ice, these balls of ice, as it passes through the galactic disk, they get bathed in blackness as it passes through those black carbon-containing interstellar gas clouds. So it makes good sense that when the Halley's Comet came close to this inner circle of planets about two years ago, and the Russians sent up a, uh, a probe, to get about two miles away from it, or 20 miles there or so, and they envisioned the, the surface of Halley's Comet, it was found to be jet black because it was bathed by carbon-containing compounds. And as, the carbon -containing, and as these comets pass through near the sun, they melt and give off tails. But those tails contain black particles that were on its surface. So what is it doing? It's seeding space itself. And it seeds space itself. And as the planets pass through that area, we have dust 
coming down from the sky. Black stuff. Melon. So I had to paint that kind of picture so you can see that despite the lie, especially in the universities, nature don't tell that lie. You can put your hand out. You can go to the clearest mountain away from New York. We got a lot of dust from smokestacks and stuff. Go to Antarctica. Put your hand out and get your melanin in your hand from the stars. Or grab your skin and don't feel bad about it because you are not second rate. Not if you, the universe is being painted with a black pen. No way. But notice this thing of Kim. So Kim refers to black and it was called the land of the black folks because they were people who live in a high sunlight environment and they had come from the south, as it was said in the so-called I mean, papyrus of, of Hunefer, as defined by Dr. Yusef ben Yarkanan, they said that the Africans said, the Egyptians said, that we come from the mountain of the moon. The mountain of the moon is another name for Kilimanjaro. Another name that is given for mountain of the moon is the, so, is the seven volcanic peaks in Uganda, the Mount Renzori mountain range. Again, these high mountain regions that also the Kilimanjaro has, has 24 months, I mean 12 months of ice in its, upper, in its upper aspects in the heart of Africa near the border of Kenya, Kenya and Tanzania. So these are important issues to contain. But Kim refers to black. Where is a name for the god that the Greeks called Osiris? The, and he was called, or he not was, he is called a netter or a god that refers to the perfect black. So we had a, a way of looking at blackness and said, no, it has, there's a way of being not just good with it, there's a way of being perfect, perfect black. And as we reviewed yesterday in the mythology, it's a very complex way of seeing things, that Wosir is the god of the underworld. He sits on a perfect black cube with eyes, the all-seeing eyes, the omnipotent eyes, the omnipotent, omnipresent eyes. And he sits in judgment of the souls of those who passed away. And he determines by the reading of their deeds, of their book of life, if they deserve to pass on to the, book of the, to the various gates of the mentor, or if they should be gobbled up right then and there. So, if you will, blackness or perfect black leads you into, very directly, statements having to do with access to a menta. What is this word, a menta? What is this word, a menta? A-M-E-N hyphen T-A. A-M-E-N hyphen T-A. Now, I should know we're using the words Wasir and Osiris, but these same names have other titles. That means the same. You can use the Yoruba. You can use Christianity. You could probably even use street hip talk and end up with some of these same names. Yimmy Ya, I don't that, that does not correspond to Wasir. But would be another of these various Orishas that we hear about in some of the African traditional religions, misnamed animism, uh, uh, in the animism. You can hear about it in the Dogon philosophy that's talked about in the book of Pale Fox. You can read about it also in some of the major Christian deities. Again, it gets being copies of earlier African issues. But Amenta is a, Amen is the hidden God. Ta is a special place or the abode. The special place or the abode of the hidden God. Now, sure enough, I have to say like, like we've said, show sure enough, <laughs> this is the real deal here, show sure enough inside of us we Africans, and all humans, have a God force within. And sure enough, 
these profound African scholars, these dedicated African men and women whose missions are beyond comprehension, had come to see through extremely detailed study that by a very exact educational process involving the training on one level, but more importantly the education by education meaning to find your thing, to find out what is your mission in life. What thing do you do perfectly? What thing do you do that sends a chill up your spine, that makes, you, that makes your systems come together, make you feel like, you, like you're running on time? What is that? But by a twofold process of embracing the left pillar and the right pillar, by training the intellectual, logical, left brain cortex by study of the science of nature itself, by observing mathematical concrete relationships and very exalted transcendent relationships, and then by training the right brain, the so-called emotive, or way of the heart, by living a right life, a Matian life, if you will, that was based upon your relationships with your fellow family members by relating them in a way in which you can mutually grow and tell the truth. That by doing those two things, you could make that left brain and right brain do their thing, and when it did so, they would begin to work together in a unified fashion, and you had truly unified the opposites, you had made one, you had put one and one together, and you had got three. And when you did the third factor, you ascended, you transcended, you transformed, your flower bloomed, your rose bloomed, your thousand petaled rose bloomed, your lotus broke out the waters of none and opened itself to the rays of Ra. And then you could be able to what? Eat that pupil. You could be what? You could be able to be, you could be able to see light itself and see a much greater range of relationships. And you could have communi communion with the immortals and other netters that were gods themselves. So this is why we're dealing with part two today, because part two we gotta kick it on up. <laughs> and we laid a foundation so we can, we can step on it a little more, more today. But notice this question of Kim, blackness, that something in it is black because it does what? It's able to absorb all forms of light. It doesn't reflect anything back. So when you look at black, that means nothing lost. It all went in. I mean, it all went in. <laughs> nothing, if you, this book is yellow. Because the color, color yellow is being reflected back. But, this color is black. Nothing coming back on that. If it all goes in, where's it going? Where'd it go? Ah. It unlocks a door. It energizes you to then have the power to transform. And then to expand your vision and to open up eye of Haru. It's allowing you to see not the external world, but it's now allowing you to see the hidden world. The Amen factor. And the Amen factor allows you to see the whole world. So these are, these are some philosophical theories and I will attempt to offer some illustrations of them in the everyday life. But these ideas of Kimware and Amenta are extremely important. Now, I'll just give you a little backdrop on the biology uh, to further, I mean, these, someone said I'm supposed to be a melanin man. I think, I think that's my mission in life. I've been told by two sisters who are both seers that, boy, you better work with that because that's your thing. And if you don't work with that, there's a sister in the invisible world who has a, who has a stick and she's going to go upside your head. If I hear her just even raising it, I say, all right, I understand. I'll try to do better. <laughs> and so we have these guardians and guides that kind of walk with us. This may sound like crazy talk, but so be it. 
Because the craziness from my perspective, I've, I've lived it enough to know through personal experience, this is a real deal for me. And so that I no longer, I am concerned with those kind of labels, but less so, because this is what it, I see is working. So going on with it, uh, uh, I've, we talked about these, the some issues related to melanin. It's a long story having to do with melanin. And let me first give you some references so you won't have to kind of struggle with a lot of guessing and belief. And these are key references. First, there is a book that we'll have downstairs that, and this is a self-serving statement if there ever was one, called The African Origin of Biological Psychiatry. There are probably just a few volumes left. Maybe they'll last most of the afternoon. Maybe they won't. And that's an article, a book that I've written that does have some key references in, in it. Uh, the African Origin of Biological Psychiatry. It has uh, the Black Dots Part 1, 2, and 3 articles, the Uraeus 1 through 4, the Symbolism of the Crown. Uh, it also has a reference entitled uh, the Eye of Huru from the Pyramid Text and the Eye of Huru from the Coffin Text. These are both old comedic books, 6,000 years old in one case, 4,000 years old in another. Another book that I would highly recommend, of course, would be uh, uh, a, a author known as Carol Barnes, who has a book on melanin, uh, the key to black genetic greatness, Carol Barnes. Another one that I would really also recommend would be a book entitled Melanotropins, M-E-L-A-N-O-T-R-O-P-I-N-S, by Eberly, E-B-E-R-L-E. Melanotropins by Eberly, pub pub published uh, by Krager out of Basel, Switzerland. Another one that I would highly recommend would be an article entitled Melanin, Melanin the Organizing Molecule by Frank Barr, published in August of 1983 in the journal known as Medical Hypothesis. Again, Frank Barr, the or Organizing Molecule, 1983, uh, the journal entitled Medical Hypothesis. Um, there are books that come out about every two or three years called the Pigment Cell Symposium, so there must be at least two books, one on normal physiology of the melanocyte, one on the so-called pathophysiology of the melanocyte, and they're published by an international pigment cell symposium group, largely Western Europeans and also many Japanese scientists as well. That's a very jargony book, full of jargon, but it's worth wading through. And there must be at least 10 separate issues, two volumes each in those issues. One could also look at the, the uh, book on the pineal gland by Russell Ritter, volumes 1, 2, and 3. That would be a very nice, very nice uh, uh, scene on the, on the pineal. A Pineal Chemistry by W.B. Quay, which was published in the early 1970s, also published by Charles C. Thomas Publisher which would be of value. One could also look at the New England Journal of Medicine. I think it was uh, in 1977, June 9th and June 6th, 16th. There's a two-part article by uh, a person named Richard Workman entitled The Pineal Organ Part 1 and Part 2. And also in Experientia, I think in just maybe this year or maybe last, there's a nice, very recent series of publications on the pineal gland. Uh, so those would and if one really wants to get a very nice piece, and you can get a hold of the book called The um, Man, Grand Symbol of the Universe by Manly P. Hall, published by Philosophical Research out of Los Angeles. And they have a very nice section on the, on the esoteric history of the pineal gland in Man, Grand Symbol of the Universe by Manly P. Hall. And so it takes you through the Western traditions. It will stop grossly short of the African traditions. Um, so these are some, some articles, and there's a, um, but then if you really want to get show enough for real with it, then go ahead and get a copy of the Pyramid Text. Get a copy of the Coffin Text, and read through the Coffin Text. The translations by Richard Faulkner would be partially sufficient. We have to do our own translations. And in that three-volume series of the Pyramid Text, you'll find over 200 individual references to the pineal gland. So that's why I wanted to take it this morning. If you're going to put up with me, then so be it. Let us look at an article that I have had the uh, 
been blessed with enough time and life and circumstance to have an opportunity to kind of tease these articles out. And I, I've been fortunate to write a little paper entitled These Electric Reference to the Eye of a Roof from the Coffin Text. I have just one copy here. For those of you who live in New York, at the First World Lecture Series in Harlem um, next Saturday, they have many other copies of this available. And I hope to be there on the 23rd of June. And there will be other copies. And also there will be a Kim Ware meeting at City College on the 24th, the following Sunday which we'll also have. Now, there's also a Chemware Science Consortium that meets every year that has many of the Chemetic scholars who work on these, on these issues. Myself, uh, Ricketti Wimby, uh, Rosalind Jeffries, Leonard Jeffries, Carol Barnes, Hunter Adams, Malachi Andrews, Phil Coran, um, and, and Francis Cress Welsing. So that's that time you have a chance to get us all in one place and kind of hear from us. Now, let me start with a reference, and I think it comes from the again the coffin text, and I believe that it is number section one five seven from volume one, page one thirty five through one thirty six, and there may be another section on volume number three. Section 859, page 38 through 39. But here's the exact quote. It reads, O N, I give to you the eye of Horu, because of which the gods were merciful. Let me give a little commentary on each, each passage. I gave you the eye of Horu, and because of it, the gods were merciful. Now, in Stolen Legacy, written by George James in chapter 3, it clearly states that the Africans saw the purpose of education to be salvation. Not training, education. And education was to be an experience in which you saved your hidden God, your ta factor, from being lost. Africans knew that inside of us, this hidden God was enchained by various fetters or chains. It was enchained by the physical coffin, the physical body. Not to put the physical body down, to glorify it, but know that if you only fed the physical body, the, the, spirit, the soul body, let alone the spirit body, would never get free. So they were about a, an exact educational process to free up this soul-spirit body from the physical body. And once that had been done, you would know it because the inner eye would open up. That was your report card. If you did it, you could see. If you didn't do it, no matter how much you claimed to have done it, they would show you things and you say, oh, I didn't see a thing. You would remain blind. I didn't hear a thing. I don't smell a thing. I don't know it. And they say, oh, slave, get out of here. Meaning what? That slavery is not only a statement of physical chains, slavery is also a statement of mental chains. Now let's freeze frame that right quick. Critically, the oppressor is a slave. Critically, the oppressor is a slave. He and she can only rule mom and daddy as long as they make everybody else slaves. If, if the oppressor is blind in their eye, then they can only rule by keeping those who have the ability to have an open eye blind. So here goes the game. Hire all educational things that can open up mom and daddy's eye. Keep mom and daddy asleep, please. Because if mom and daddy ever wake up, King Kong will get me. That's the basic fear underlying their thing. Yes, Darth Vader, you will get me. But Darth Vader had to have a black voice. One going to pay him front money. Because everybody inside of themselves know 
You don't have to really listen to Richard, Richard King to know this. You know it. How do you know it? And you, you, everybody has this dialogue. Everybody really knows the game. Because <laughs> the inner mind is always, this tall thing is saying, hey, wait a minute. You might be a slave, but hey, check this. It's always rapping to you. you say, oh. Now, could it really be that crazy? Yes, it is that crazy. It could really be, that could really be going on. I could really be a god. But no, I, I but, you, but it's always telling you what's really going on. And you have to keep it quiet because we've been trained to what? To keep it hidden. But back to it, the slave master very actively, who is a slave hit for his or herself, because they have eaten only the lesser eye of Huru. They got a little bit of knowledge, but can't go beyond that, because they're not leading, living, ethical, moral lives. Here we are in New York. Bottom line, it's a crime only if you, only if you get caught. That's the bottom line. Dog eat dog. Give whatever rap you can to get over. It's the epitome of the Western world right here. Only a fool tells the truth all the time. Say what you got to say to get over. But Kamites knew that, hey, I have to tell the truth because Ta inside of me knows. And one day I must face this. Kamites led their life not for the immediate present. They led their lives for eternity. Because I'm a God. I'm going to live my life based upon godly principles. And I want to make sense to myself. Not to whether I can get over with the IRS. Whether I can get over with this cop, that cop. Or with my wife or my child. I got to make sense to myself. So they had a much higher standard of philosophy and psychology. And so I'll say to you again that, that the issue of freeing up the inner God is very, very important. But it's done by, again, by a two-fold educational process, a trained knowing, knowing uh, science, and also studying ethics. So the first step of the educational process was one in which you, quote, you first realized that such a thing was even important. You wake up and say, well, wait, wait a minute now. You mean I got to... I mean, I can't go for the New York hustle? I can't live that way any longer? There's something else out there? I gotta pay my bills. I gotta get my sugar. I gotta have all these girlfriends or boyfriends to make me feel powerful. I gotta have this little chemical jack up to make so I can, so I can quote, get ready to get ready. <laughs> I gotta have my taste. I gotta have a finery so people will get who, who who will give me entree just because of my presence and what I appear to be able to do for them. I gotta have something, but something else is no, 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 no. Uh, that ain't what it's about. So the neophyte is the beginning awakenings of this, and at that point, as a psychiatrist, which I am, people often experience headaches, pains. You know what I say to that? Good, glorious. Lovely. You hurting? All right now. You're waking up. I've never seen a painless childbirth ever. The pains. Are you dying? I feel like I'm dying. You look pretty intact to me. I feel like I'm dying because I'm beginning to, quote, to look at things that I was miseducated in and I was told lies. I was told that if, if I don't have this, that, and the other, that people won't love me, that I can't make it. But goodness, I, I'm letting some of these things go. I'm not throwing away all my responsibilities, mind you, but I'm beginning to do some other kinds of work that folks call crazy, and people are actually, and I'm actually beginning to feel better about it. It don't make sense to me. My, whatever didn't tell me this was the way, but it's beginning to make me feel fed. So here we have this top factor it begins to wake up, a person begins to feel real pain, illusionary pain, the pains of birth. And as the tall factor wakes up, it begins to exercise its hunger, a kind of hunger in which you can't even feel fed by a physical thing. No matter how much love action you put inside yourself, 
No matter how many goodies you put inside yourself to toss it, that ain't the food. <laughs> That's not the one. And then you begin to feed it knowledge and good deeds, and you begin to feel uplifted. Oh. So that continues on, and a person begins much more involved because the education that is required is one of a lifetime. And it is, again, a very detailed study of mathematics and knowledge and science, a very detailed relationship of study of relationships, a very detailed self-examination. It is shown enough co super college degree stuff where you sit down and keep a, a daily dream record, for example, and you study math, you study science, you study relationships, you find these other things to make sense of your environment, and you do it in a very exact way. You know that going to the library is a kind of feeding. Going to the museum is a kind of feeding. That you need to have a shelf full of food called books to feed yourself and feed your family. And that goes on. At the same time, one has a very active dream process that is telling you where you are in the process. First one begins to have images of the wild girl and the wild boys, depending on whatever physical sex type you are, trying to say, come here, little sweetie thing. <laughs> and then one has that kind of dance that you begin to, quote, change your relationships and begin to ask for more mature relationships with your spouse and of yourself. And as that continues to grow, then one has what is called the mystical marriage, the holy union, the conjunction of opposites in which one actually has an intimacy with self. Not talking about somebody living on a mountaintop being a hermit, because how are you going to find out about the African, if I'm an African man, how can I find out about the African woman except by being with her and dealing with her on a day-to-day -day basis? Yes, she's going to change on me every day, every minute, but I do the same thing. And we have to deal with each other, and we have to, quote, hold a mirror to up to each other to reflect each other's contradictions. You said you love me, but you do this and that, but, and finding what works and what doesn't work. This is a very important thing. But listen here, it says, I give you the eye of Uru, which beca uh, because of which the gods were merciful. The gods were merciful because you had begun to communicate with them. You could talk to them. I'm going to go on for a few minutes more, and then we're going to have questions and answers, so we'll have an active dialogue. Nothing worse than to sit here and watch somebody go on and on, because the mind at a certain point would just say, toodaloo, <laughs> don't tune out. You have to get overload. Or, or, or you begin to have, or as you sit and talk, certain thoughts may trigger flashes to other times in your own life, and you find that the ta factor is actually working, or you're beginning to think of the things that seem not to be related but, but it's already pulling you in. Or you just might be utterly bored to let me just hurry up and get out of here. I wish I had enough guts to walk out of this guy's presence. <laughs> but anyway, it says, When I give you the eye of Uru, be take it to yourself. I give you the eye of Uru, which they guarded. It is guarded, no doubt about it. You do not gain access to this powerful stuff unless you can pass the test. And the, and the gatekeepers are who? Who are the gatekeepers? The gatekeepers of the Eye of Uru are our grandparents' grandparents who have already passed on. Your bloodline of the men and women who have done good deeds are the one who are living entities I don't know where, but they live. And they consciously communicate with you and I in the here and now. And they determine whether you and I are qualified even to gain more knowledge. Dr. King, that's not said by Sigmund Freud. No, it is not. He wouldn't say it publicly because he was quite aware of the game. Um, but it is said, let us check it out. How would you know? How many of you have lost a mother or a father? Shortly passing, shortly after they passed on, when did you see them again? Did they come visit you in a dream and talk with you? Was that just fantasizing? 
wishing him to still be there? No, 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 no. How many of you have gone through periods of crisis thereafter? And mama and daddy came back to you again. They never leave you. But see, if you know that, then you're not a slave. If you know that mom and daddy could have passed on and still talk to you, then the oppressor could not scare you with his, with his paycheck. Because you know that something else goes beyond the grave. And yes, a paycheck is very important to pay immediate bills here and, here and now. But there's some things that are beyond the paycheck. And I must keep that tight too. I must be in communication with that. So, it is guarded by our ancestors. They're determined by your good deeds because they know that you can get this information and this way of living. And if you abuse it, you can hurt yourself easily. Easily. You can easily open up an eye of a roof factory with somebody who's undeveloped and you can and then you can get in communion with the lower astral forms and be possessed by devils and demonic demons easily real quick possess you in a minute and say go do this go do that and give you a rap that makes a lot of sense but it's all wrong give me an example dr king Try any heavy mind expander, chemical mind expander. What do you mean by chemical mind expander? Well, standard street drugs or drugs that I give under the guise of medicine. <laughs> I can put some drugs on you in a minute <laughs> that'll put you in another state. <laughs> and if you don't have the right heart, and someone will grab you in a second and take you out of here real quick, and it will all make sense. You can be it crack cocaine, be it marijuana, be it old granddad, be it some vodka, be it water, be it a lot of steak. No matter what the chemical mind expander might be, that if you get into a, a, a so-called uh, subliminal state in which you're almost in a, in a half-sleep state where the conscious mind is kind of suppressed and you're beginning to have revelry, you know, kind of a dream state in a while awake, um, you can get possessed easily, easily. I give you the eye of Haru with, with your mouth is open. The pupil in the eye of Haru eat it. How can you eat the pupil? How can you eat the center of the eye when it is all black and nothing but space itself? I think our people are trying to tell us something in that very profound remark. You're trying to, I think, and it's only my own, my, again, my little Watts country boy from Watts, California, that's where I grew up, uh, understanding it's only his guess, that it may be saying there's a blackness that you can swallow and you have to be prepared to, to let yourself go and to swim in the sea of none and to not look upon yourself as, quote, trying to be in charge of nature, trying to be a hot, hot dog or a big, big power in charge, but to see that you are nature itself. You are, you have been born as a child of God in the bosom of, of, of nature, and you are well loved. And you're not alone. That mama and daddy and all your mamas and daddy that preceded them are with you every second of the day. And if you do right deeds, they will walk with you. And heaven is not a thing to, to be. Heaven is right now. It all depends whether you can, quote, get to the heaved up place or a so-called heaven the crown factor, and unlock your ta or your eye of Haru. Oh, and I give you the eye of Haru, and you will not be ill. You will not be, get ill because you will not get out of step with yourself and develop disease that will then be just an attempt to bring you back to self. So these are some points that are raised up under this heading of eating of the eye of Haru. Uh, again, the pineal gland is a light, which is the physical counterpart to the eye of Haru. The eye of Haru is said to be the so-called third eye.
Ayafu Ru did not originate in eastern India. It originated in Kemet. And we called it Uraeus. U R A E U S. Uh, looking at the name Uraeus, U Re Us. The Ra, or the light factor, that binds you, binds us, back to us. The Ta, that God factor inside of us that binds us back or allows us to be in communion with the us. The name for the us is called the nun, the collective unconscious, the tree of life. The tree of life being all of your ancestors who make up your bloodline, past and future. Now, uh, a point to be given, let me just kind of take a little sideline. Um, certainly, there is a knowledge that is being passed out to this day of, of how some of these things apply. And, it's, and there is a certain cultural groups, and the Western world has expressed a fair amount of their so-called knowledge of so-called esoteric science through a thing called the Kabbalah, the K-A-B-B-A-L-H, Kabbalah, K-A-B-B-L-A-H, or K-A-B-B-A-L-A. And it supposedly had a secret, the written in the unwritten Kabbalah. And supposedly, in the 1300s, a Jewish scholar in Spain committed the unwritten Kabbalah, which was an oral tradition, to, to the printed page. Now, the Jewish scholar in Spain was a black person, a black Jew, who had come, who was part of the Western Africans who had migrated to Spain from 700 A.D. through 1400 A.D. and ruled Spain. And that Jewish person was part of a group of Jewish of black Hebrews who had migrated from Kemet after Kemet, and once Kemet fell, and migrated across the whole width of Africa and were part of the, the black Jews who were Africans who were present in Western Africa. Now that has nothing to do with, with the Khazars who were, came from what is Western Russia who adopted Judaism in an attempt to be a world power and not take on Christianity in the West or Islam in the East. So you can want to read about the 13th tribe that describes the issue of, author by, of the <coughs> so-called Kosar, K-O-S-A-R, by Arthur Kessler. That would be of extreme importance. But <coughs> it is said that the Jews received that supposedly this Kabbalah which has several, uh, again, the literal and dogmatic parts, uh, literal and dogmatic and, and other parts, that, that the Kabbalah was received by Adam in the Garden of Eden from the angel Raziel. Now let's decipher some of this. The Garden of Eden is where? Africa. Ra, you see right away. Sun God Ra and Adam or the so called Admon Kadmon, which you read about in many other works in the Kabbalah and certainly in C.T. Young's Mysterium Conjunctionis and uh, the Collective Unconscious volumes in his collected works. The Adam Kadmon is often pictured in the, in the alchemical works as that in the vessel in which the alchemical work was done. There was a black factor in which the Admon Kadmon made up the black stuff from which the later things were made from gold. And later we transmuted from the raw material into gold. So it was saying that what they're from all of us, we all came from a black origins, all humans, and that no matter where you are in space and time, there is a huge strata of the unconscious mind that is your black ancestry. So that's the key part. Another part is to ask, when did... When did the Jews leave Kemet? Or when were they asked to leave? And why? Now various scholars will have severe conflict and various 
close, close African scholars that I hold in the highest regard will certainly tongue lash me for saying a thing like this, but I must bear with it and try and stand to be corrected. But perhaps, I say perhaps, during the, in the period after the overthrow of the Hiscos, with the emergence of the so-called New Kingdom, the time of 1718 dynasties, was the War of Liberation, in which they were forced out, and the people who were called the Hiscos, and the black Hebrews had, had supposedly struck an alliance with the Hiscos, and they were being asked to leave because they had been, they had collaborated with the invaders. But nonetheless, in the book Moses and Monotheism by Sigmund Freud, he clearly says that Moses was an Egyptian hierophant priest, and that the Mosaic laws that they took out of Egypt as they were asked to leave did come from the Egyptian priesthood, or it was their, their high science. So, so I would say that these, this, the Kabbalah originated when they left Egypt. And they took with them certain books that were being used in the universities at that time. So if you hear about the so-called Kabbalah with its 22 major arcana and, and 56 minor arcana and its various stations and paths, then you must ask, does that bear any resemblance to the Book of the Gates that was being used by the Kamite at that same time or the Book of the Celestial Cow? Then you should go ahead and read the copy of the coming forth by day, the so-called Book of the Dead, and read about the 22 gates, the 21 gates, and know that you're talking about the same thing, and it has an African context. You can really skip over or, or see the correlation between the Kabbalah and the Book of the Gates, and they're very, very important. So those are, those are important issues to consider. But let me just kind of end on this, on this issue about the eye of Peru, and then we'll have some questions and answers that will illustrate many other points. The pineal gland is a light-sensitive organ. It is present in the midbrain. It forms the floor of the third ventricle, the, at the back of the third ventricle. The third ventricle is a fluid-filled chamber that contains the cerebral spinal fluid. In the front of the third ventricle is the, is the pituitary gland and the pineal actually works very closely with the, with the pituitary gland and the other endocrine glands along the spinal column axis. During nighttime, the pineal reaches the hormone melatonin, which affects the onset of sleep and dreams, and during daytime, it releases the hormone serotonin. The pineal gland in the older life forms, be it fish or reptiles, amphibians, exists as an actual third and fourth eye on the back of the head. So when you hear about the so-called eye of Huru, understand that we have inside of us a gland that used to be an eye of physical vision, but now it is an eye of transcended vision. It really is an eye. But in the higher life forms, humans, it allows us to walk around with a portable library that is infinite in degree. So humans walk around with a portable library that has everything that exists in nature in its memory banks. Hear that? Humans have a terminal or an eye that allows them to access the so-called universal memory bank throughout all time and space. And by being able to do that, it makes you a god. By being able to do that, it makes you a god. You have the knowledge and you have the ability to project yourself, the core of your soul body, in time and space itself. So that's a real gem in, a, in, a, in kind of a capsulated form, I, I believe. Um, the pineal gland um, works in concert. As a person becomes more spiritually developed, it will increase its hormonal output. And it will operate more in synchrony during the daytime. You will have melatonin release during the daytime. The hormone melatonin has a profound effect upon the pigment production throughout the brain, throughout the skin, throughout other organs as well. That the, horm that the hormone, melanin is a hormone, is present not only in skin, but also in the brain, brain stem and other body sites, in the meninges, the, the, the lining of the brain. It's also present in the lungs, heart, all the organs. 
and it's said by some to allow, and it really is, to understand it, it probably is more of an issue that you can approach by a study of electromagnetism or magnetic fields than you can by looking at simple linear uh, cell link-ups. It's much more complex than that. Um, the hormone melanin is present, again, in, in the melanocyte, which originates from the neural crest. That when it, as the melanin is present in the father's egg, mother's sperm, prior to conception, upon conception, it forms the outer, it, it organizes itself in the outer coating of the early prefetal cell called the blastula stage. It is present in the outer uh, germ layer called the ectoderm. The ectodermal layer invaginates, becomes the, a, a so-called neural tube. The neural tube becomes the brain and spinal column and is blackness all along all of that. From the neural tube and neural crest, the, the, many of the, uh, the, the pinealocytes and also what later is called the melanoblasts do originate and populate the skin at the junction of the epidermis and dermis. Then it also, and then the, the melanocytes are also, the pinealoblasts also originate there and later are organized in the core of the brain in the midline of the brain itself. That the hormone that is released called melanin, melanin is injected into skin cells as they migrate up from the dermal layers of skin up to the surface layers, and that the hormone organizes itself over the nucleus of the skin cells. It protects the cells from exposure to sunlight and ultraviolet light, so it will stop them from becoming cancerous upon the, the loss of base pairs upon exposure to UV light. So this is a very important issue, but also it acts to modulate light as it passes through. Melanin does circulate in blood, especially in the, in the, in the lymphatic flow. You want to read a book called Ethnic Pigmentation by H.P. Wasserman. But the pigmentation that, that passes in blood also help, is also, people who have lots of pigmentation like you and I, we have melanin deposition in the lymph nodes. I'm giving you kind of a long spill now. In the lymph nodes, uh, and people have pigmentation. There are altered levels of adrenal, adrenal steroids in black folks as compared to whites. There's a different level of the... And when it comes to the subject matter of melanin, well, that's an ocean. So let's just take a little cup full and sustain ourselves with. And let us begin with this concept that in terms of how old is melanin. What is melanin? How does it work in us? And is it present in some people and not in others? Let's take the last point. Is present in all living life forms that have a backbone. You hear that? Just as chlorophyll is present throughout the plant kingdom, melanin is present in the animal kingdom. I don't mean in terms of any kind of morality, it's just in terms of it's able to capture light and to pass it on to do other things as an energy form. So chlorophyll <coughs> captures light and produces a few that allows these the, the uh, plant kingdom to flourish in a like fashion, melanin captures light and allows the animal form. So let's do a little brief review of 101 embryology, 102 anatomy, and 102 called living. First, where does it begin? The key atom that makes up long chains of melanin is made in the core of a star after it goes through a conversion from a diamond core, which is crystalline carbon, and then it implodes and goes into a supernova, hundreds of thousands of several million degrees centigrade, expands out in space, and sheds that, that fractured diamond <coughs> into a form called nano diamonds, N A N O diamonds. Nano diamonds make up the dust of space. Now we have to step back a minute and, and realize this that in terms of 
life itself, the universe, is made up of dark energy and dark matter and light energy. You know that dark matter and dark energy makes up 96% of all of the universe. So, so all the stars <laughs> that we see <coughs> throughout the universe is only 4% of reality. The vast majority of the real world is dark and black and unseen. It doesn't mean that it's dirty. It just means that it's ancient, trillions of years old. And so your ancestral realm to which we moved is made up of all of that dark stuff. So to pass and be in the communication with the dark realm, and you, if you want more on this subject, I would encourage you to read Science Magazine, Science Magazine, June the 1st, 2012, last Friday's issue. Hmm. And it has an article there about dark matter and dark energy. There used to be when people would start discussing melanin, say, oh, that's pseudoscience. But let me tell you, when you quote in Science Magazine, you're quoting the top journal in science and the English speaking world. It ain't, that's the top of the line. So, this notion that melanin is something dark or unseen, what about different forms of humanity? If you do not have melanin, you can't even get conceived, let alone born. Let alone grow up and become an adult or a family. All the humans are different forms of humanity that vary in different shades of skin melanin. The skin melanin is made with the enzyme tyrosinase. There's some genetic defects that cause some to have more, some to have less. But have you ever heard of a word called neuromelanin? Melanin in the brain itself? And you know that neuromelanin is made from the enzyme hydroxylase. Now you can get a copy of a book that's entitled Why Darkness Matter, talk about neuromelanin. Or one of my books called Melanin, A Key to Freedom at, on Amazon.com or The African Origin of Biological Psychiatry, also on Amazon.com. And they were going, it goes into great detail with a lot of the And I have some new ones that are in my mind that are in various stages of production. But notice this. When a mother, where is melanin before a child is conceived? It is present in the outer layer of the mother's egg. It is present in the mitochondria, the engine producing organelles in the tail of the father's spermatozoa. When those two meet, and then they join together within a matter of hours following fertilization, that, that, that fertilized zygote doesn't allow any more sperm to come in. And the outer layer of metal from, from that mitochondria in this father's tail, and the other one in the mother's egg, joins together and makes up the outer coat. So melanin in the fertilized egg, so that the, uh, coming back to it, the melanin formed in the outer layer forms the fertilized ectoderm. There's a middle layer called the mesoderm and the inner layer called the endoderm. And that's present of all life forms with a backbone. That's how it is in your mother's fallopian tube, whether you are a fish, reptile, amphibian, mammal, higher or lower mammals, certainly any kind of human, from Russia, from Japan, from Brazil, from any place. This is a basic formula 
of living life formed on this planet. On the third day after that fertilized ball of cell, which is called in technical language the morula, which means black bone. In other words, no matter what your skin on may look like, your black ball is passing from your mother's fallopian tube into the uterus, the holy womb. And it impregnates in the wall of the uterus. And on that third day, it begins to produce two hormones, HCG, human gonadotrophic hormone, and melanocyte stimulating hormone. HCG is a hormone that is measured to prove that a sister is pregnant. You look at those HCG present. But that's, if you see it, it means, oh, that black ball is inside the womb and being nourished by that womb. So, and then there comes that black dot where the point of fertilization takes place. It begins to move. And the black dot moves up and forms a line. The length of that line becomes the spinal column. That black dot itself expands out to become the brain. Mm. And so that outer layer is what we call neuromelanin, black stuff. Now what does it do? Melanin way to the unseen world of dark matter and dark energy. Did you hear that? Melanin is a doorway to dark matter and or energy. So you hear it too. You hear it with your ears. But in all of these sensory organelles that receive external energy and translate it to signals that can be processed by the mind, soul, and spirit, they all pass through that black realm. In the inner ear, you know there's melanin in the, in, in the inner ear? The only reason why you can see me if you sit there is because you have a layer of melanin in the pigmented lining of the retinal epithelium. The reason as melanin, as you eat foods and on the, uh, underneath the, the epidermis of the lining of your, your gastrointestinal tract from the mouth all the way to the anus, you find this basic pattern of melanin underlining the sensory epithelium that's translating energy from one realm into the other and then sending signals back out. And you are in constant communication with the ancestral realm in the past, in the present, and the future. And as a brother made known, it speaks about it in rhythmical formulas. Rhythmical, it has a rhythm. If it hits a certain chord, then it hits up and makes association to other things of the same rhythm and lights up like a Christmas tree. And that's how our black minds uh, function. So we're not just here in this space and time. We have antennae trailing out of the past, present, and future. That's a much more. Now in ancient Africa, so well, Dr. King, he said, it's been studied like that. Give me an example of how it was present. Uh, remember that. And the soul of the sunlight was then possessed by that black stone. And the black stone was usually put as a conical point on the pyramid. Not pyramid, but in, in triangles at the top of obelisk. And it represents, if this is a model of the original pyramid, which is a human form. Mm. And top of us, all humans, there is a bin bin stone. No matter what the skin color is. Why? So this is skin melanin, internal part is neural melanin. I have a very good buddy of mine who I went to medical school with in back at Clarence High Show. He is a black neurosurgeon from Alabama, Birmingham, Alabama at that. And he said, man, when I work with people's brains 
and I look at those parts that have neuromelanin in them, you know, that they don't say, what color is it, man? What does it look like? He says, it is biofluorescent. It glows the different shades of color in the darkness. That's a living brain as biofluorescent, where the melanin is sending energy in and out in different realms, and it's then being processed by the human form. So imagine neural melanin being a biofluorescent kind of energy. So that this is a very important one. And when you go to sleep at night, most of us are raised up to believe, oh, dreams are unimportant. That ain't nothing. That's a sign of post-traumatic stress syndrome sometimes. If you, get, if you have a conversation with your soul, can you listen to yourself? Can you receive? One, one brother told me, for example, how he listened for himself, and one of the forms in which his soul could speak was that he would pass gas at certain times. Or oh, he feel movements or touches different parts of his body. So I, I hope he didn't have a, a double two. <laughs> or if he had a, or you could smell the greens in his gas. <laughs> but all those have meaning. All of them have meaning. But again, this idea of the Ben Ben stone, light coming from the sun and entering the Ben Ben stone, and then light will then be released from the Ben Ben stone and be taken by the Ben Ben bird to fly back to heaven, heaven being the center of the sun. So this idea of star worship and sunlight worship is not unique to Akhenaten, A.T. Dynasty, uh-uh, well before that. So when you find people who are rediscovering African rites from ancient civilization, and they, or after they have done some pretty rough things to their own parents and ancestors, called it slavery, mental, physical slavery, or whatever else you might want to call it, uh, they have a certain amount of guilt and a fear, not all, but many, of a judgment day that someday somebody's going to knock on my door and what will I do? Where can I hide? How are you going to hide from Mr. Mellon knocking on your door? <laughs> and how can you face yourself and make a different decision to do better if there is a next time and not to do the same wrong thing? that keep people bound down and stuck and stupid stuff. So again, how, what's a good way to look upon melanin? If you look at a door, it has a left pillar and a right pillar and an archway. Well, show me, Dr. King, where is melanin present? Do you see it in the left pillar representing the male left brain? Do you see it in the right pillar, representing the female cortical hemisphere? Do you see it in the archway that links two together? Show me, Dr. T. When I went to Kemet and went to Abydos, where Osiris was said, the head of Osiris was said he buried, I saw the doorway leading from the outside courtyard that led to the middle courtyard. I saw in the doorway leading from the middle courtyard going into the innermost courtyard. I, it looks like this is the brother walking up right on time. I saw that that black gate was indeed the, what is called the threshold, the bottommost archway to which you, in other words, had come from the ground up. But the ground represents that 96% of reality, the dark matter and the dark energy, the dark matter and the dark energy. So I would say to you that as you 
meditate and hear yourself talking yourself and to know that this is a culture that deals in the material realm, lower material. It has a problem dealing with the mind. It is sure enough got a problem dealing with the soul. Spirit is out of sight, out of mind. But you are bubbling over with all of those mental, soul, spirit questions. You hear it knocking on your door all day long. And unless you are fed there, you have a sense of being incomplete. Empty. Hungry. Hungry for what? How to develop your mind. How to develop your soul. How to come to know, to know your own spirit. So though those are, are kind are the struggles of us all. And I as a psychiatrist see all too often as I read the great work on being done by Dr. Omar Johnson, the children going through school who are told, will be told, you can't do this, you can't do that. You don't have this credential, that credential. You didn't come from this kind of pedigree. You don't, you don't, you don't, you don't. But I'm saying to you, my sisters and my brothers, that 96% of all the universe comes through that black door. What kind of pedigree roll call is there in that? Who is to say that you don't have the, the supreme mind of Enzinga flowing through you? Who is to say that Emotep doesn't come talk to you from day to day and night? Mm -hmm. Who says that? If you have a dream that wouldn't it be wonderful if I could, that's only telling you that's what, I, that's what I want to do. So I won't be you with a lot more questions. Uh, 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 is the brother here yet, Brother Johnson? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I thought that was Brother Johnson, the way his presence spoke for itself when he came. Is he here? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay, so just give me a hand sign when you're ready, Brother. Okay, so. Do any of you have any questions? He'll be here up and he's just getting his fantastic before he comes on. Do any of you have a question or two or a comment or two before I pass this on to our illustrious speaker, Dr. Omar Johnson? Yes. Yes, I have a question. Uh, we, uh, we know that uh, us black folks, we have melanin. There you go, let everybody read your question. Okay, now for the Caucasian. What can you speak on the melanin that they have? Okay, well, as as the goes. correct term for me is a European African. Okay. <laughs> that during the time after the African root population, which was roughly two million years ago, left Africa and moved to the other continents, some of them went through adaptation and result to ice ages. Ice ages occur roughly every 100,000 years. So read about the great floods, the great earthquakes, the so-called uh, Rusto shift, the movement of the South Pole to different locations. And what are we coming up on on the 24th, 20, and the 23rd of December, as predicted some of may take place. Then there are changes in the surface pigmentation as people struggle to survive. Now, some, there's also cosmic ray influences, where when there's something goes supernova that is nearby, then the people who are exposed on the surface, if they don't have sufficient melanin, won't survive. Mm. They have to go inside a cave or a hole just to stop the intense gamma ray production that the melanin sometimes can absorb. Can you say that again? That the People have to go into places to escape don't have surface radiation if they don't have sufficient skin melanin to absorb the intense sunlight that's going, that is the result of some local supernova that may be hundreds of light, hundreds of thousands, millions of miles away, but it passes as quickly as light is and then bombards the whole region of space around. And these things occur periodically. 
we know that during the last ice age, that when somebody else was freezing to death in the high mountain regions, that such was not the case back home. People were living in grandeur and in splendor. So there's a tremendous amount of envy and hatred for mama and daddy who had it going on. But mama and daddy tried to forewarn them. Hey boy, you say you're gonna walk on, you wanna get, to, you got some, some new housing. Lots of land up there, huh? Do you know what time of day you, it is? Can you go up there? Can you come back home if things turn on you? And the average young person will say, I got it. I can handle it. Not even knowing what mom and daddy's talking about. And so some of them did pay some grievous prices. And so when they came, and also the issue of pineal pigmentation, the loss of the same amount of pineal hormone release, people who have fair skin having only one half as much melatonin and serum levels in their blood. That doesn't mean it's not operative, it's just reduced. So they, they hear the signal, but they don't hear it clearly. Misinterpret the signal as noise. It must be a big cat getting ready to jump on me. No, that's a reefer Franklin fool. Don't you? <laughs> that was because uh, Eddie James <laughs> singing at last. <laughs> so we missed the point. We didn't understand. You know, you don't, you don't, you turn on your TV and you see fuzz up on the screen. You don't see a proper picture. That means Im imprecise reception of the signals being broadcast to you. So these are very, very important things. Now there's another brother who's going to do the introduction, or sister, or Dr. Omar Johnson. And who is that? Uh, who's going to, who will do the introduction? Can you speak a little louder? Because we have melanin, what are some of the things that we can do to evoke um, getting closer to that spiritual I'm still trying to hear you. Come to the mic. Come to the mic. Yeah, because we have melanin, what are some of the things that we can do to evoke or get closer to that spiritual realm that you were talking about? And yeah, what are some of the things, I think we've already talked about here, one way to pay attention to keeping our vessels clean and pure. So you can, quote, not get stuck in a rageful state. I've heard Dick Gregory say, if I'm full of rage and be on a payback mission, I want to, I want to practice vengeance. I want to practice aggression. Then I, it causes me to have a cloudy filter. If I'm mad at that end, be it woman or man, or what I think they did or didn't do to me, all the while denying how much I still love them. And there was some sweet times in you, oh, baby, baby, <laughs> that we possessed. And then we got afraid of each other and stopped having honest conversations with each other and trying to make a way for each other and trying to heal each other with the struggles that we have endured. That, and also revealing where we've been hurt in life and where we've been uplifted. That that, that tone of heart sets the stage of the clarity of the reception. So you want to keep it as pure and as uplifted as you can. So that when you get your visions of whatever is coming through as to what you are being called upon to do with perfection, they would say, how well should I develop my skill to a, not a good level, not a great level, a perfect level, they called Horace, he was perfect. He was a perfect black man. He wasn't a good black man. He wasn't a perfect. And Isis was not a good black woman. She was a perfect black woman. So the, the standards that we set for ourselves, and then trying to be, and they also say you want to be on other people who have similar attributes, who find the spiritual order, 
people have similar skills, so you can sharpen each other. It says steel sharpens steel, and black genius sharpens black genius. I've had the pleasure of being a student of Dr. Ben for 30 years. And when he was a black genius. Somebody want to call him out. I've seen that man stand up and recite libraries, page, paragraphs, sentence. And have you read this book written since 1785 on paragraph 6 on, on, on page 344? It is reads like this. And then from his own memory. Exactly. So that when you're around them, you get the feeling that that's just expected. You have a good memory. And as you take stock of yourself, your memory greatly improves. It becomes automatic. So, and you won't be photogenic in that you can remember everything, but most things. And on top of that, you'll have feeling called tone clues and cues that will lead you in which your own inner realm unveils things. I'm going to say this one little point that will pass it on. And then one last question that will pass on. The question of the unveiling. I would hear, oh no, that ain't nothing. That ain't, that can't be what it is. That's not academic enough. Oh, but guess what? It would whisper at me again a few hours later, a few days later. And if I just listened long enough and changed the angle at which I was looking at the thing, I saw the dots connect another way. So, oh goodness, what's happening here? And I could sit back and let it reveal itself in another dimension. So I'm saying, have trust that you don't have a good black brain. You have a perfect divine black brain. And when your black brain taps into things and reveals it, I don't care who, how many PhD people stand in front of you and try to tell you that you're wrong. Just smile and say, well, thank you. And move on down the road. Question comes. Who gave the first PhD a PhD? Who gave the first PhD their PhD? Came from someplace. Yes, brother. Yeah. First of all, I, I want to say, um, you, know, you mentioned you, you mentioned the part about I got a real bad back today. I tore muscle. Okay. Please forgive me. Yeah. First of all, um, yeah. Yeah. you talked about the um, melanin, and um, I guess most of us know that melanin helps us gain a little bit of color when we get into the sun. So, uh, as I've read and understood from different people, even as you said, Dr. Ben, yeah. a long time ago, I took Dr. Ben for lunch. We had yeah. What I'd like to ask you is, uh, can we say that we are people of the sun because of how the sun works in our melanin? You know, we call ourselves the children of the sun. In ancient Kemet, they called the skin the flesh of Ra. The flesh of Ra. We call this third eye the eye of vision, of inner vision. Spiritual vision, genius vision, that was given to the son of Horus. Now Horus, or Heru, was the son of Osiris. Osiris had been killed by his redneck, jealous brother, Seth Typhon. Does that sound familiar? Had been killed by him, and he had snatched all of his possessions. So when Haru grew up, he went up to King Saphtipha and says, I understand that my father 
did all these great things. Do I have anything left for me? So it's like all of us coming and waking up out of slavery, mental slavery, poverty or whatever, saying, well, I know you got, you're a billionaire and a millionaire. Do I have anything for me? You know what he was told? No, you have nothing coming from me. I don't know you a deep thing. And what was Haru's action to that? He went to war. And in the course of that struggle, he lost his left eye. And he cried out, oh God, I've lost my eye. Uh, Seth Typhon has knocked out my eye. And God says, don't you worry. The God of magic, science, and writing is going to give you a new eye. And he was given a new eye. That was the eye of inner vision. So I guess what I'm saying to you is that, yes, it is a sign of a badge of honor. But we have to ask the question, where did we come from? We came from a struggle that's been waged over these past certainly 3,000 years, some say 6,000 years, post-last ice age, we're in an interglacial period, and we are again waking up to reclaim our inheritance and to raise it on to even a higher level of attainment. And then, and then the advice from, from, your, from your eldership, I know that all of us come from different places, you know, even though we all have different views of blackness, you know, some of us are educated, some of us are not educated, some of us live on this, this side of the street, some of us live in the projects, the retail, whatever. I ask to you, what is your advice to us so that we can inculcate or share information after we leave here? That's it. Yeah, I, I would say, please treasure your relationship with each other, cover each other's back, trust each other, trade with each other, love each other, work hard for each other. Bring it on around. Thank you very much. We are hoping that you can make it out to Long Island University tomorrow at 2 p.m. Well, could that have been a metaphor for something else? It could have been a metaphor, but then there's going to be a whole lot of metaphors. I mean, it, I'm certain it's a metaphorical thing, and that's the key point about the Bible or any other mm -hmm. holy book, is people were having to write in code because they were up under the emperor's uh, henchmen, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So there's a symbolic meaning. When we write, you write literally, but then the spirit writes symbolically. Mm -hmm. because though you may have a cover-up on the surface, Truth. Another deeper meaning is there symbolically, whether you want to get in a numerological way or symbolic way. And that's another one of the issue. But there is going to be a cover. Now, but another, getting, back, getting back to the issue of cover up, mm -hmm. um, as Dr. Spender Common has made known, that if Abraham, the patriarch of the Hebrews and the Arabs, mm -hmm. yeah, they come from the same line, uh, was in 1600 or so BC, and all the pyramids had been built. By at the very latest, the eleventh dynasty, which mm -hmm. is taking us back at least to uh, at least another um, uh, two, three hundred years, if not more, before that. Mm -hmm. You can't you can't build already built. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And so that's that's another great uh, contradiction. Mm -hmm. If we read Sigmund Freud, a Jewish person or mm -hmm. Hebrew, uh, European Hebrew, African, whatever how you want to work all of that. In his very important book, Moses and Monotheism, that the other Freudian psychoanalysts do not want to talk about. Mm -hmm. And what he says by his analysis, and by the way, Freud is a psychologist who was given credit for discovering the unconscious, but himself was an intense scholar of African, particularly Egyptian history and Greek history, but particularly Egyptian history, all of his professional life. Mm -hmm. His death was covered with Egyptian artifacts. He studied the God War Theory. He studied a mental in intense detail. Start off studying hypnosis from uh, 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 
from from out of La Charcot. That's not none of the story himself, not the name of the time. But Freud said that, that Moses was an Egyptian hierophant, hierophant, a hierogramic priest, if you will, and that he was from the, around the time of Agnon, and that he was a high priest in the Egyptian in the Egyptian system, mystery system, and that he did lead. And that what was called the Hebrew faith was really Egyptian or Semitic religion. Mm-hmm. That's what this man said mm-hmm. himself. He cites mm-hmm. many examples. Mm-hmm. And that they so that in other words, that what we what we see being passed out as a Judeo Christian faith that is coming out of the Hebrew, whoever they might be, in the so called Exodus, whoever they might be, and was it an Exodus? How could it be an Exodus? There's no written record of it. Or was it a, a time in which Africans had originally been under the thumb mm-hmm. of foreign invaders, black folks and Malala folks, white folks, coming back home to Egypt and causing dissension and chaos mm-hmm. and imposing artificial alien rulers during the 14th, 15th, 16th dynasty on Africans. And Africans finally getting their heads together again and throwing off this fragmentation, putting husband against wife, Mm-hmm. brother against brother, sister against sister, and united again and expelling them mm-hmm. in the war of the liberation of the 18th dynasty, pushing out the Hyksos and forcing them all the way back into Europe, was a time in which those who had been allies of the Hyksos were forced out too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so that when they left, they took the religion they had been exposed to. Because it was a religion that had been developed way over many, many thousands tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of years of study and contemplation and actual seeing things mm-hmm. that the physical eyes could not see. But back to the documentation, uh, we find a very important uh, book, uh, um, Man, God, and Civilization by John Jackson. That's true. Uh, we find another little small pamphlet by John Jackson on Christianity in which he cites a number of very clear-cut documents. He's worked so hard on this subject to close show clear examples. Mm-hmm. We find in the fourth, in the volume two, volume four, number two, the General Baptist Civilization, a very nice article by John Jackson, in which he shows that four key features uh, present in the, uh, in the, uh, in the uh, preparation of Christ as he moves, as he returns and moves up to the spirit level occur and are seen as pictorial representations on the walls of the temple, the center of the African university system at uh, at Ithaca, or what is known now as Luxor, Temple of Luxor. And so here are these, the Annunciation, the Announcement, and another part that have to do with uh, uh, the rising, the raising up of Christ, uh, following the, uh, as he went through the whole transformation mm-hmm. during, during the period of his Crucifixion, so the, or even, or even the impregnation of Mary, and when, which is announced that she is carrying the Holy Seed and that she will give birth, and all this shown in pictorial form and written form on the temple wall of our own temple. And this again, 1,500 years before the birth of Christ. Okay, so we have the Annunciation. Uh, we have the Virgin uh, birth, so to speak. We have uh, the the death. Uh, the crucifixion and the resurrection on the walls 1500 years before Christ. Um, I remember when we were in the tomb of Sati the first and we were looking at many of the uh, religious figures of the religious cosmology of the African. I could not help but feeling at that time that our ancestors must have spiritually known that there would come a time, this time, uh, because everything on the walls depicted that there would come a time when death would come to them. And it, it, it just seemed to me subconsciously that perhaps they wrote all of this on the wall so that when this time comes and their children, who would awaken out of a sleep, um, unknowing, of their history and their past, that they wrote it there, sealed it uh, so that it would last uh, 
for thousands or hundreds of thousands of years so that we would be able to then go back and look at and read and understand and disciple uh, out of the sleep knowing who we are and, and where we come from. Can we talk about that spirit, what you saw there, some of those things that would give you to understand the spiritual essence of the African, where today we may not be in that understanding. Yeah. What were some of those relationships? Well, there were there were things that were shown. Uh, I remember very clearly that time we went into them. Yeah, uh, for, you know, very very plain. Uh, they were shown people. I recall one one thing you point out. You asked a question then. I did not have the answer for it. Mm -hmm. The question stayed on my mind. I kept nagging. I kept hearing the question. <laughs> <laughs> And one was uh, a picture of people who were upside down. Right. <laughs> right. Absolutely. <laughs> who were standing on their heads. And they were supposedly in a mental, mm -hmm. in the other world. And then later I came to read this next week's mm -hmm. and read that they prayed that they would, when they went into a mental or into the underworld, they would not go into the world upside down. And I thought about it, and I'm not certain if it's correct understanding on it, but it comes to mind at this time. That if you go into a mentor, and again, a mentor represents what the thought psychologists would call the inner mind, mm -hmm. or that world that's underneath your feet, the subconscious with many levels, and we should talk a little about the different levels. Mm -hmm. That there's a part of our, our mind that we can, that our memory that has to do with our immediate life that we tend to forget things that happened in childhood, things that happened just yesterday that we experienced and we totally forget about. It. We can't really recall without much effort. There are memories that we can recall only in unusual circumstances because there's a lot of layers and resistance. Our experiences that are that occur uh, in other places, other times that are beyond our even knowing mm -hmm. and being in heaven before our own birth in our mother's womb. There are ways of seeing things that connect us to all of our own family members, either in the past, present, or future. And so these different levels, be it called the collective unconscious of the great seed, the ma, mm -hmm. um, that extend beyond time and space, are a part of all mind, if we can both be that spiritual enough to, to hear it, see it. The conversation with the other angels, so to say. And all of that is a part of it. But, and indeed, we do experience it while we're awake, and we certainly experience it when we go to sleep. When we go to sleep, we experience, we, we come back home, if you will. Mm -hmm. But to go into it, into it upside down means to go into it confused. Mm -hmm. To see things topsy turvy. Mm -hmm. To not even to, to see. To glorify the lowest thing and to minimize the higher thing. Mm -hmm. That's the point about being upside down. That's a statement of being a slave. Mm -hmm. In other words, there's a mental slavery. Yeah. Out of lack of knowledge, if you do not know what you're seeing, you will misinterpret it. Absolutely. You will misinterpret what you're seeing. So to go inside the inner mind and to see a black goddess and then to think she is going to be somebody who's going to seduce you out of your mind is to be upside down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> to go inside of your mind and see a black god or your old great grand great 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 grandfather and not know who you're even seeing. Mm -hmm. And to think he's a rapist. Or somebody coming to mug you mm -hmm. is to be upside down. To go inside of your inner mind and just see an image of the oppressor who sold your books and burned your libraries. And to embrace them as a safe person mm -hmm. who is on right mm -hmm. is to be upside down. To see yourself and to think that you are inferior and to think that you don't have what it takes to face the questions in life is to be upside down. To be so afraid of death itself that you can't even get on with life. You're too afraid, afraid of this, afraid you're going to lose your money, afraid you're going to lose your house, afraid of 
what the neighbors might say about you, afraid that your girlfriend will say that you're a chump because uh, this because you as a woman are quote loving that man too hard, mm -hmm. or that you are a chump man because you're doing too much for that woman. It's to be upside down, to be afraid to work a long 10, 12, 14 hour day to bring home something for the family. It's to be upside down. So these are different aspects of being upside down. There are also examples of people who are shown with their heads cut off the body. Right. It gets cut off. Sure, they just have lost their consciousness. And totally mm -hmm. out of it. Mm -hmm. Totally unaware. Head was off the body. Meaning, big head. <laughs> you lost your head. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You lost your consciousness. And it's a way of killing a person. The person was dead. They were dead. Other examples of being in the lake. That would be, uh, you can shoot that from over there. You want me to start it out? Oh, yeah. Okay, let me go my nose first. <coughs> Come over here. Uh-huh. All right. We were, we were talking about losing one's head and having a big head. Uh, and could you continue? Well, these, these are my just interpretation. And, of my and all of these are going to come up because I'm going to use the footage of where we were in the tombs and bring all oh, these okay. things up. Okay, so we're losing one's head. There was another one of the. There's another one of sometimes standing on serpents, and and riding serpents, or serpents connecting certain uh, a, a line of different people with images, and and the serpent has many different meanings. Far beyond, again, what the lack of knowledge has given about the serpent. It was not just, they, were not, they were not just the evil serpent, there was also a good serpent. There was a mm -hmm. serpent in our own final column. Mm -hmm. And there was a serpent that represented time itself. So that look upon time as a cyclical process, look upon time itself as, the, as, as being pictured symbolically as a serpent mm -hmm. was very, very important. So, so, so to show people being linked by a serpent is to show that, that we are being tied by cycles of time, mm -hmm. patterns of relationship. Uh, there were some examples we saw in the of the first. We saw the, the cross. Yes. <laughs> yes. We saw the cross all, all over the place. All over the place. <laughs> and again, this was before. Again, this is goodness. Uh, at least found it for the birth of Christ. Mm -hmm. At least. And we saw. Uh, the ox, which was the credit, which preceded the cross. Mm -hmm. uh, we saw uh, and the, the, the tower cross, the cross with the three bars across. Mm -hmm. We saw the Ramadan or the swastika. Yes. On, on there for I mean, at least 3,000 years before the time of the Nazis. Mm -hmm. All right. And so we, not that it was linked to the Nazis, but it, again showing that they were philosophical ideas. Cross and, uh, and many other features that we find related to the uh, current uh, symbols of the Christian faith. Mm -hmm. uh, we found that there were examples of, of the moon, we saw the crescent, we saw um, uh, many astronomical features that were present mm -hmm. as well. Uh, I think we, even, we, were, we were really struck by the cross being present all over the all right. and, and we asked what, what that might that have been. And just a little bit of a backdrop about the about the uh, the ox, which precedes the cross, um, and me, Dr. Ben O'Connor, on you know, one occasion was going through the, through the uh, museum, and a reference came to an early example of the ox that was from Nubia, that preceded at the beginning of the of the dynastic era, mm -hmm. and this one showed again the the, the line of the ox, and the ox has a a circle, like yeah. over the top. Right. And on this one, there was two circles on either end. And so he pointed out that the uh, that this early example of the cross, if you will, was based upon the Africans' study of humans and other issues as well. That it represents the union of opposites, the union of the female genitalia with the ovary at the top and the birth canal leading up to the ovary with the male phallus or penis and the two testicles 
before we decide. Mm-hmm. It's showing it not in a negative way, but in a positive. This was a life. This was a, this was a divine union in mm-hmm. which the life force of the male, when being placed in holy union with the life force of the female, brought about a new life. Mm-hmm. And so it speaks. So the cross, in some respects, meant well before the time of the so-called crucifixion of Christ. It made reference to the union of opposites of the bringing together the, of the male and the female mm-hmm. to bring about a, a another life form. And that again was upholding the divine mm-hmm. uh, The Much of the, many parts of that had to do with, again, in terms of how we, uh, uh, the key issue was how do we approach death in life? Mm-hmm. We commonly think that this, what we're doing right now, is life. A major statement: well, This is death. We commonly think that we should not. When, when, you, when you say what we're doing right now, you know, uh, that this physical life that we have is a time of being alive. Yeah. Okay. And some of you know this is a period of death. All right. That we left, we left heaven, okay. and we came to hell. Okay. This is hell mm-hmm. right here. Mm-hmm. That's. That not knowing that is being upside down. To think that you live, that you hold, you hold, you're trying to hold on to this. This is hell. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that you are trying, you prepare yourself to go to heaven. Mm-hmm. Not to think you you want to jump off any building immediately, but you have certain issues to raise up. Yeah. And you find another book that is a famous book that is the, uh, uh, um, uh, another book that was a, a person had a conversation with his soul. Um, and facing the issues of wanting to commit suicide, this is a uh, rather than faith issue of life, in a, in a book that was written by Deacon Reed, entitled Rebel of the Soul, uh, it's the same as Adam of Papyrus, which says that uh, when this person said, well, I've been a good, righteous person, and I should just, and everything, all I see is iniquity, iniquity around me, and the wrongdoing, I should just give it up. And the soul said, wait a minute, before you do this, before you hang your life on that peg, mm-hmm. your soul belongs. Me. If you were here in hell with a mission, mm-hmm. you are here in hell with a mission. Mm-hmm. You came here qualified. You came here with a thread to weave in the holy fabric or human family. Get on with it. Mm-hmm. You got the power. Mm-hmm. You have the power. You can't see it around you because you're upside down. But as you come back to yourself mm-hmm. and draw upon it, then you will. Mm-hmm. So there's, there's a whole thing about us coming to terms with what am I here for? Who am I? Mm-hmm. Who am I? And so we find that example in the in the book Soul and Legacy, which is a great book by George James. He made reference mm-hmm. to that that the Africans knew, not believed, they knew mm-hmm. that you had to do two things. You had to, one, you had to cultivate your mind by study of science. And you had to live a virtuous life. If you did both, you could reach a statistic vision. But some of those virtues are important to spell out. One of them was be able to define what order did you belong to. Mm-hmm. In other words, what kind of great work that you could do very perfectly did you belong to? And you should find other Africans who are doing the same work because they could help you and you could help them. Mm-hmm. Uh, we all we have certain groups that we belong to in terms of, in terms of creative work. Mm-hmm. We also had another thing that you had to, you had to find what your mission was in life and be about it. Is that your one mindness that we work to, to obtain? The one mindness, as you say, to get to Africans that think and understand that in order for me to get back to that pathway of eternal life, that my righteousness spirit, my righteous spirit has to be cleaned up and aligned again with that righteous force of creation. Right. Now, the more that I align my righteous spirit or my spirit to righteousness in relationship of my, my one-on-one with my fellow man and all of the laws of the universe in relationship of love, peace, and understanding, as I, Ben Robinson, clean up my spirit to get back to that, you understanding that, that that is the contact that I have to make in order to continue to move on. Very much so. So this is the this is the hell that we're living in. It's not knowing. It's not knowing that you know, the the the, uh, the the way to get out of hell 
is to is to get that in, that oneness of, of contact with the creative source so that I can move. The example that I have to give what I'm trying to say is that when the evil force wanted to take Job, the creative force said to the evil force, you can have everything but his soul. But now the creative force knowing that that is what keeps me in contact with my with my missionaries, uh, uh, Job was able to pass through the destruction of, okay, I don't want to get into that, but all I'm saying, I just want to try to, to make clear in my mind that it is my spirit that I must get into complete righteousness, and as I run across you working on your spirit, getting in complete righteousness, we understand and recognize each other through the spirit. Indeed. Okay, peace. Indeed. Indeed. You, you, have, you have a spiritual mission, and find out what your mission is, and being about it is so, so fundamental. And it's not just an end. I mean, you, you, can, you can look at your past history and see what you have been excited about doing. What do you love to do? And what do you do in which magical things happen? And you're doing things in so-called, I mean, seemingly strange coincidences take place. Things seem to happen by accident. Things, doors kind of fly open. When you experience that, and, 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 and each person still remember, but you feel out, outside of yourself sometimes. We call it miracles. Miracles. When the miracles start happening. Okay. Mm -hmm. When the miracles start happening, that's real. That's the invisible world pointing you, anointing you on your chance, on, on your mission. You, you say you, you open up a door, um, which I think is very important for African people for their survival at this particular point. We were in the caves, we were in the tombs of Egypt, looking at symbols and trying to decipher what those symbols meant then and what they mean to us now. But an overwhelming uh, understanding, as I perceived it there, was that the spirit world uh, was paramount to the African, not the physical world. Uh, the physical world only in the sense that uh, we express our spirit through this physical world. But they understood principles of life. Um, mineral uh, gives way to vegetable. Vegetable gives way to um, animal form. Uh, animal gives way to, to, to spirit. Uh, and that's correlated with the principles of the universe. The less dense penetrates the more dense until we get to spirit which penetrates all things but is penetrable by no things. Uh, so we are spirit beings and, and then hooking that back with Christ who, uh, who was a representation of ancient crisis within Egyptian order which was a evolving into a spirit being and I asked you a little earlier, could, could, you, could you give us some insight on African religious cosmology from maybe the Uraeus, but uh, certainly we, we talked earlier about beings that existed, that, that things that we have forgotten. To me, the Christ was, was, was a door which has always been there to, again, be one with the universe yes. and that universal mind which you have yes the, 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 the inner system they had the three grades person was a neophyte okay person had no knowledge mm -hmm. second stage in you reaching the elite level of intelligence which you had developed in a vision and you had and you had these elements the third stage is when you reach the level of son of light not only had a vision but you had unity of light in other words you had become christ light amen you begin to radiate light. Okay. That's <laughs> you, could, you could see the light. In the spirit, you could, you could see beyond those things that were just dense physical. You could have conversation with the immortals. This mm -hmm. was infinite. Mm -hmm. and, and, and entities beyond the, mm -hmm. the physical realm. Mm -hmm. uh, the, so they had mapped out in clear fashion uh, the steps and doorways that one would go through as one reached a spiritual presence. Mm -hmm. And they, they, they knew the battle was won of the same thing we have right now. Can I find it? Mm -hmm. Can I hold on to it? Can I get that real thing? Can I, can I hold on to it? It means our own soul, spirit, complex. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And I hold on to it from the prison of the physical body. Mm -hmm. And I hold on to it when the physical body is saying, I want this right now, I want that right now. Up with the lower animal mind. Mm -hmm. Can I hold on to it? Can I break free of the fetters that chain me to my physical mm -hmm. body? This is what the European, the European is just a person who is, who is thinking on a lower plane. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's dealing with an animal mind level. And we have, and all Africans, everybody starts off that stage, but you, you have to break free of that. Right. Question in this, in this. Let, let him develop it. Okay. And then. Okay, so it, you have to break free of it. Mm -hmm. And you break free of it by, again, very important, living a virtuous life and a study of science. In other words, by knowing the way that the force of nature operates, mm -hmm. then you can watch him yourself and you can be in step with the laws. The laws of the laws of nature, the laws of science. Science is the law of nature. It is not no ugly thing or space or Frankenstein madness. That's that myopic character of it. It is just a mm -hmm. beautiful, loving way. So we are not on the sideline. So much of our people's miseducation now has to do with a very, very poor way in which science is taught. Mm -hmm. Science can be taught just like coal train. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've seen some brothers that teach it so sweet. That it just when when you heard it you you didn't forget it as soon as you heard it they just broke it right down to to nub put it in in symbolic form where people like to hear it mm -hmm. and it just made it so sweet it just stuck to you it just didn't even leave you mm -hmm. uh, but but back to the key point a little, little bit more on onto the what we saw in the tomb we saw many examples in the tomb we saw different uh, animal forms being represented and some of them, oh they worship the animals mm -hmm. and that right. completely missed the point. The point was that we were showing, we wrote in words, but sometimes the message got so heavy, you couldn't even write in words. Mm. <laughs> you had to write in geometrical symbols mm -hmm. and animal form. In other words, if part of your mind speaks to those times from your ancestral time, before there were written words. Mm. Kim E. Do you want to see Kim? How many want to see Kim today? Can I see Kim? Show of hands. I would like you to turn to the person to your right and ask them to open their eyes, and the person right against the person to your left, and look at the pupil in their eyes. You see that black dot there? That's Kim. <laughs> You're looking at Kim. You're looking at the retina, which contains a black layer called the the pigmented retinal epithelium. And it's at that place. What's going on? Light is coming through. Is going through a threshold, being kicked up, and being converted from a light signal, a photon particle of light into a chemical electrical signal that's then passing down your optic nerve into your brain and cerebral cortex for processing. That's an example of melanin in action. It ain't no further than, than, the, than the pupil of your eye. And so when a person comes to you, oh, this ain't nothing but some melanin BS. Or the professor, the white professor tells you that, sir, would you look at your black self? <laughs> Explain to me how you even see me. <laughs> what is the physiology of that? So those are, you know, those are fundamental, but that, that same kind of phenomena take place with smell, taste, touch, the, the uh, melanin line of the co cochlear epithelium in the inner ear, same story. The melanin lining of the pulmonary bronchioles, the melanin lining of the epithelium of your urogenital tract, and show enough the melanin lining of your stomach, small intestine, and large intestine. Big time. 
big time. Now, if you as you go, so here we on page on one forty three, it has the morning, the first group, the morning, the praiser, the opener, the charis, the incomplete one, and the corruptible flesh. So if you look at number five in the upper register, first group, the charis is number four is equivalence to the I-33. And so, so you're looking at on different levels of, of development. Number four that was present as the charis in the first group becomes the I-33 in the second group. In the third group, it becomes the induator. So at a certain point, when you're just being exposed to these melanin materials, you will have a feeling of being flooded in an ocean. You will feel hopeless. I can't learn all this. This is too much. This is impossible for me to embrace. And your answer? One step at a time. You are what? A God. So this, this you have the potentiality to embrace oceans throughout the cosmos. That's how infinite the black mind is. It is not inferior. It is superior. <laughs> Repeat that. The black mind is not inferior. It is grade fine to the 10,000th degree. This is something that is able to capture and hold the soul of the sun. That's not the sign of an inferior mind. Yes. Yes, brother. Go right ahead. Um, yes. Dr. Ben established that um, Socrates was a black man. Yes. Although in college and school you learned that he was a white man. Yes. Um, what you're saying, Socrates used to teach the, 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 the students those things. Yes. So that's why they claim that he was corrupting the minds of the youth. And yes. That's why he was forced. To drink Yes. It was said that Socrates was a true student. He wasn't like Aristotle or some of the others who were, who just, when they were made to stand up for their test, ran and hid. He said, No, I'm not going to hide. Let me take my life, so be it. Because I know that I'm beyond this physical body. And if you look at the pictures of Socrates, or which the statue of him is in the British Museum. He has long, kind of straightish white hair, or straight hair, whatever that means. But his features, full nose, big nose, full lips, African face. So those are the kind of, again, the kind of erasures in history that have taken place. And so that the, the uh, to, to know, yes, so what I want to do is um, there's one there's one of the names of um, I think melanin that I think that you um, um, that you that you didn't talk about. Um, wait, 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 which one is this? Um, this is actually it originates actually from the from Keck and Keck Keck, right? Um, the primordial ape. You okay. know the primordial ape. Okay. Amen, Amenet. Okay. No, no, no. Okay. Keck Keck Keck. Darkness and, in its opposite shape. Okay. Right. And hey, and hey, hey, right? Yes. So, the darkness, the fundamental darkness in cosmology, right, is the beginning black. It is the first black. <laughs> it is that black that has needed some energy. And Dr. Oyibo talks about it in, well, he begins to talk about it, but. It needed some vibration and energy to separate itself and create light because there was no light. It was in the beginning it was just black, and it needed something to separate. And we, what, one of the things that we don't do is we don't have an explanation for it, but we needed a vibration or energy to separate blackness to create light, okay. right? So now that keck sound, right? That keck sound is fundamental to all those different things like chemic. 
right? The KH sound is fundamental to Khufu, right? Okay. It's fundamental to a lot of the sounds that deal with black. And it starts with K. No, I must admit that I'm, this is new knowledge to me, so I don't have, I haven't put it in my oven, so I have to just take it in and think, thank you for your sharing. I welcome whatever resource you give me. And in future times, I will let it let the oven speak back to me. I just don't know. I know I have a book that I gave Sister Kevin for review, written by Rosalind Jeffries, where she did go into these God types. The that, that is, these are the four. If I, Dr. Lewis, these are the four pairs of gods that are present left in the primal waters of Noon right. that were talked about in the Memphite cosmology. With George James. Hilly Heliopolis. Yes. Yes. Hey, Dr. Jeffrey, how you doing, brother? Power to the people. Brother, did, did, did you bring the Arouse and Jeffrey's book, man, and what on? I, don't worry. I, I got you. I got you. But, but, but I, I'll have to take that under advisor, my, my brother. I, I can't say one way or the other. I've thought about it, but I'm not completing my reflections on it. No, but I'm, so what I'm saying is that, well, you know, Dr. Rosalind Jeffries and Dr. Leonard Jeffries, they're, they're, my, they're my family, so we are connected, yeah. so okay. we, we talk about this, right? Yes, so I do much, yeah. So, um, we're, so we were close. The, um, yeah. But the KH sound, yeah. right, fundamentally in, in, in ancient Egypt, right, when you have the metanature, the, the language of the Egyptian, or, or um, the metanature, they are primordial sounds. Yes. And the K sound comes out of blackness from the beginning yes so that's what i'm just trying to say okay so when we we you're talking about humans right things that are fundamentally involved in melanin as far as human but humans come much much later, later and yes. it's all connected so if you want to look at like the theory of everything or quantum physics and black matter and and yes. Yes, very much I do want to look at those things, but I do want to look at those very much. And I would say that the, now I'm glad you bring up this issue of the, in terms of the, of the, and the spreading of the black family through different dominions. And so at one time we have a thing called human, and we also have a thing that may have been called homo erectus or whatever. And they talked about those things that lack a cortex and how they're processing information and having communion with other out-of-the-body kinds of entities. Those are things that must be considered. But that's, again, I, I mean, that's just new work for me to even to get up close on. So, I, 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 again, I welcome your comments, brother. Yes. Just a question. When one loses the pigmentation... In your skin, outside, does it also happen in your brain and in the other organs? There are there can does be a loss. You psychologically? Usually, no. You can have a loss of like in that twelve chain nuclear, twelve pigmented nuclei. The earlier life forms have fewer than twelve that are pigmented. So, like fish and amphibians, maybe five, six, and the the, the closest form to humans or the chimpanzee, which have eleven. Only human have all 12. What is unique for humans, the 12th one is more actively involved in dream states. I'm not saying that chimpanzees don't dream, but the question of being conscious and being able to want to control one's actions while in a dream, that's, that's another question. But there are loss of pigmentation in a disease like Parkinson's disease, where you have a depigmentation of this 11th in the 12 chain uh, steps. You lose pigmentation in the substantia nigra. And when you give medications to try to replace the lost pigmentation, many times the people have become depressed, anxious, or psychotic. You can kind of overdo it. be carefully titrated. In fact, many of the so-called mental health problems in the psychotic realm, in the depressed realm, in the bipolar realm, are being medicated through various chemicals that lower or, or expand 
the amount of dopamine or pigmentation in those 11th and 12th nuclei, mm -hmm. most certainly. So that, for example, a person who comes in who's floridly psychotic, been up here using a lot of crystal meth methamphetamine, smoking a lot of PCP, drank a lot of alcohol, or has uh, been a victim of horrendous sexual abuse, or battlefield experience, for example, when you've gone over the top, you watch your best friend been blown to bits, you yourself have lost all of your limbs, you waking up in a bed with a fragment of your whole body again. That in those kind of persons, uh, you often give medications that do play upon either increasing or decreasing the melanin in these 11th and 12th, or in the chemical pathways leading up to it. You either increase or decrease the, the epinephrine tract and the catecholamine tracts. You either increase or give it mood stabilizers. For example, if a person has a bipolar illness, you're commonly given a combination of an antipsychotic and a mood stabilizer. So you can stop the swing, because the swing will come in, either a depressed swing, and greatly expand the delusions and the auditory hallucinations. Or in a hypomanic phase, do the same. Uh, but then what does that say for a person who, what about the natural swings of creativity? What about the natural swings of scholarship? What about the natural swings of self-discovery? What about when you run into certain conflicts that have existed in your family line over generations? Where there's been a confusion of the wise old man or the wise old woman because there was an elder who misrepresented that archetype. And you had some confusion there. And then you run up to it, you run into a parallel archetype of the abuser, so to speak. Or what, do you, what if you run up into a person who's lived been raised in a household where they've been told, you're stupid, you can't do this. And then they, they, they have difficulty seeing themselves as a young Horus type who has the, the energy of the infinite warrior going to go ahead and ride over the sunset on his vision quest or her vision quest and you've been got all these you can't do it, you can't make it kind of stuff and how do you so yes, like that, those are very now we're touching upon areas that I vision from afar but I know this is the work of a nation of people <coughs> And many of you will expand and go much further with it. Yes. Uh, what about the names that are given to children? Because the names that you give to the children impinges on the soul. Very much so. The names are really extremely important. As I've said, the Ren or name or the vibratory significance. Again, you can take your name. I'll give my own self as an example. My name is Richard D. King. D does not stand for devoid. D stands for devoid, D-E-V-O-I-D. It, it does not stand for David. I can't believe it's David. It stands for devoid. Because my great-grandfather, when he came out of, out of the Civil War and he went up to the Freeman's Bureau, the crackers were all putting down the name devoid. <laughs> for the middle names of black folks in New Orleans or in Homer, Louisiana try to identify them as still black folks. But then he chose the name King because they used the name Devoid not in his English name, but in his French name. The French name Devoid is also de Devoir, capable of doing the work of. And then the word D for me, as I went with my master, Dr. Uh, Lagan, I said, Doc, Doc what, what is, look at your name. You see your name D? That can also relate to the idea of Daleth, D-A-L-E-T-H, back in the uh, in the in the so-called Zohar or in the Kabbalistical structure. The idea of a doorway. So that's why I got into this idea of doorway, left, right, pillar, archway, and the threshold. And I found there was so much to melon when I went to the idea of threshold. Uh, so that and you can take your name and add up all of the, and there's a, so you have to get one of these capitalistical books and you can divide it, but, but, but caution, 
they use, you can either do it under the English name or the Hebrew lettering or numbers for the different letters. If you use the Hebrew, you can add them up to a certain number, and then you can get your your divination, your divinatory significance, and you can look up what, what its so-called inner meaning might be. Yes? Has there been any serious work in possession as it relates to African spirituality? The the is there serious work on possession? I think there is a huge, you're asking like a giant question with a giant answer. And so I, all I can do is point to certain, certain directions. Um, and so we can talk about the concept of Ifa as it was talked about in terms of the Wild person who went inside the mountain and he shot an arrow at this wild boar and he hit the boar and he went to follow the boar inside the mountain and he used the twine of the rope so he wouldn't lose his way coming back up as being a symbol for going inside the immense or the underworld and as he went inside a white witch jumped on his back and took possession of him and then he went down into, the, into their home into their home into where they all lived and they wanted him to. They wanted him to do the dances and keep them all happy. As Twa often painted as being very significant in doing, and then they released him to come back above ground. So this word ifa, uh, for one of a better word shambhala, for one of a better word vodun, for word with spirit possession, uh, um, speaking about the various uh, Yoruba gods. Um, and I've seen many of books that correlate the various entities to the various comedic gods um, and also the Christian gods. When we go to a place like Brazil, for example, they just took the Catholicism on the surface and put their <laughs> spirituality on possession underneath. And certainly, we're coming from my place, Louisiana. Whoa. <laughs> you know, so they. Like, Big time busy. And I have seen it with many of my patients and ourselves in walking in daylight when a person is possessed by different entities when they are not being conscious and they get certain kinds of states that come over them. What kinds of uh, techniques can they use to release themselves from such a possession? How do they stay focused? Uh, so I think there's a lot more that has to be done, and there's a tremendous scholarship, vast in extent, and and I often have the desire of wanting to know when I speak to a person who's my patient, knowing there's certain words of power. I wonder why when they walk in some days, we can't go no place. The, everything that fences us up sky high. In certain days, it just flows. In certain times, you hit on certain things. They can come in, and I can feel their presence. And what is so important is to, first of all, to have a... I, I don't want to be an imposter to say I'm having an empathetic relationship, because that's rare. But at least a sympathetic relationship of how I could feel for their being where they might be at that time. And feeling myself inside of them as they're, and I'm walking behind them as they're on their journey of life. And coming to certain doorways. And on this question of possession, a common sight is coming to a doorway or a, a doorway and, and the question comes, what will it be? Will you make the right door that leads to ascension? Or you take the wrong door that leads to going to hell? And and you and so that's that's often a uh, that's often the, the critical thing to be faced. Uh, but but to, but to come back to it so that there's a book called uh, Embodying Osiris. I didn't bring this to Kevin. I left that one at home. And this was a book by a white Jungian analyst out of Santa Ana, California, 
but he was talking about his work with patients and how he come to various spiritual issues and the kinds of imagery that they presented to him. Now, I think there are big flaws in that as a black community person. You have to kind of look what parallels are there in your, and there's a certain part of it, he's just way wrong. He just doesn't, he doesn't have a glimpse of, of it as, as you will see it. Uh, and there's also a question that comes in terms of, well, why did what happened and what the first big, uh, how did it, did it, why did it take place in Haiti? What was this, with the Dominican Republic? Clearly involved in spirit worship in trans states to this day. What is the correlation between that and Palmyra in Brazil? How does that play a world with revolutionary freedom struggles to this day? How did that play a role in Cuba? Even with the conversio, Fidel Castro, who is, who is a Sephardi Jew, how did, how did that play a role in the freedom struggles in, in, uh, in Cuba? How does that play a role with black folks in the here and now? And how, how do how do we draw upon that in our ancestral lines? So those are those are, again. I, I'm a novice in that realm, so I really can't speak with knowing. But I do know that there are many, many works that need to be expanded upon, and that is a very, very valid way. Anyone who wants to put down African spiritualists in possession is being racist and foolish. How dare you disown our high-tech science and psychiatry? No way. Yes. Um, I missed what you were saying about dopamine. Dopamine is a yes. form of what was that you said? Dopamine is a pre dopamine is a a precursor of melanin. Imagine melanin, big 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 mom and big daddy, and all of these. Carbon, the key word is carbon compounds. Some of them are in long chains. Some of them are circular benzo, benzo six ring chain, uh, circuit cycles added in, with chains added on. And so we have what's called catecholamine, which are long chains of carbon bound to each other with, with hydrogen and other and oxygen and other and, and nitrogen added on. And others of them are endolamines, or the endo is a benzene ring, a, a chain of six carbon atoms bound together as a circle added on with, with lines of carbon atoms added on. So endolamines are examples are serotonin and melatonin. Catecholamines are two major nerve tracts. One of them are called the norepinephrine tract. And one of the, and, then a, and, and that norepinephrine tract you run into the acetylcholine tract, which is the, again, the right pillar. And then the left pillar is the epinephrine tract. Epinephrine is a chemical of fear. When you get that, tighten up, you're ready to fight flight. Acetylcholine, you're going, oh, fill back, and you want to go into a slumber. You go into an inner, inner dwelling trance state. Whereas endolamine, and serotonin. Serotonin is what we call a memory readout hormone. You take it and it prepares you to be active while conscious. Melatonin, so it incorporates memory into from your everyday life into your memory system. And whereas the melatonin is a memory readout hormone, you retrieve revelations and inspirations from your memory tract. And then you're trying to make new associations with them. And so these, but all of these can feed into a common parent called melanin. And they, again, these are living systems. They don't just all go in one direction. They're always sending things in and pulling things out. There's always a dynamic equilibrium. Things being sent in, things being set out. And, and, and then the melanated tracks one of those is called the interstitial nerve tract. That's the 12 pigmented nuclei in the brain stem. That's, that's the Ben Ben Stone, Ben Ben Bird. Interstitial, now you would, 
is a book that my neurosurgical friend talked about called the <coughs> surgery of, on the third ventricle. I don't, I don't recall the author's name, but there is such a book that does exist. Most of these, you also find books in your medical libraries on the circular ventricular organs, CI circular, C I C U L A R, circular ventricular, V E N T R I C U L A R organs. These are the organs around the ventricles. The ventricles being, again, lateral ventricles, the wings of the bird, third ventricle right above the nose, front part is the pituitary and the hypothalamus, back part is the pineal gland. And then the aqueduct sylvia get into the fourth ventricle. I had an experience with the fourth ventricle when I almost died of a stroke. You know, I left cerebellar stroke. Bleed. Hemorrhagic bleed. And hey y'all, uh, I went back 10,000 years in the past, 2.4 billion years in the future. I was afraid to go to sleep because I didn't know where I was going to wake up. I saw that. I left my body and went up down the hall and this the doctor talk about my case. Yes. Uh, I don't quite know how to phrase this question, so I'm just going to throw it out there because there's so much talk about um, 12, um, 12, 11. Yes. You know, the uh, lining of the planets and. Uh, 20, 20, 12. Okay. Oh, yeah. somebody else see? Uh, so, um, since we are spirits, God's having human experience and etc. The realigning of the planets, um, which they are saying culminates a twenty-five thousand year cycle, yes. um, and that there's going to be changes uh, brought about by these planets. I, can you speak on that in any well, way? I, I can speak about some various projections, and they commonly cite the Mayan calendar which dates this date as being the end of this epic. And they say that this is a time there's going to be a pole shift in which the crust of the earth will then shift, slide over the mantle, and the North Pole will become a new North Pole. And of course it will be accompanied by cataclysmic geological catastrophes. Now does it be important we go to the book and Stolen Legacy, and it, and it is reference made that the Africans told this guy named Solon in the city of Sais, 550 BC. When Solon visited Egypt, he was bragging, and again, 550 BC, 550 BC is after the Assyrians had occupied Egypt, 666 BC. It is before the Persians, and then he got free of that, before the Persians came in in 525, and certainly before the Greeks came in 332 B.C. But anyway, Solon was bragging to the high priest at the city of Om. He says, look, we have all these ancient people, and, these, and the and high priest stood up and said, Solon, Solon. And this is, there's a reference to this in the works of Plato. In the Tiamas. He said, You Greeks are always children. That's an important thing to take note. You Greeks are always children. I mean that he had assigned to them, he says, You know nothing about the people who are, live where you now live, who were there before you got there, but periodically there are great geological catastrophes, and when they happen, the people who survive, rather than pick up where the others had left off, they have to go all the way back to the beginning, all over again. So that's three things. One is that when a, when a catastrophe of that takes place, that people go through permanent PTSD. Post-traumatic stress is a very important clinical condition to be studied. That you can be out of connection with your ancestral base. You can 
get out of connection with your ancestral base because you have to go through the horrors and memories what they went through. So many of us, as my brother asked the question just a little while ago, don't want to remember what it was like to be a slave. Don't want to remember what it was like to see your mother being crucified. Don't want to remember to see your father being castrated. Don't want to remember what it was like to see yourself being beat down because you didn't bow to Mr. and Miss Charlie. Don't want to remember none of that. And in the doing so, you give up your emotions. You give up your emotional responsibility, as Dr. John Andrew Clark says. History teaches you where you are now, how you got there, and what is your responsibility to do about it. So you can look at that and see, well, Mama went through that. Oh, no, we got, there has to be some judgment day on that one. <laughs> there has to be some vindication. We can't just pass over that. No, because I'm carrying too much weight. My children are carrying too much weight. Secondly, it makes known that the Europeans were defined as people who were neophytes. They had only had gone as far as grade one. They had not gone to grades two or three. Mm -hmm. Therefore, they were considered to be children. <coughs> when they, with their white mind, looked at their black ancestors, mm -hmm. the common root that I get is envy and jealousy. Yes. Envy and jealousy. You got more than I got. Where were you when I was in the cave? Where were you when I was up there in that ice box and that inside that high mountain valley surrounded by those five thousand foot glaciers? Five mile glaciers. Where where were you? And jealousy. There's another discussion which we need to really expand upon. What kinds of wrong deeds have these people done with their own African community African communities that made the African community exile them into those northern regions? So that's a story we got to have some dialogue on. What had happened? What had how, What kinds of misdeeds had been done? If you're worshiping, if you're going to tear down the black god, then how? what was that all about? What was all that about? If you're going to have a, uh, a idolized white ice and put down blackness, What's all that about? Mm -hmm. So that's those are so the post-traumatic stress syndrome, the issue of the uh, the uh, being stuck in grade one, and then this issue of uh, coming to terms with the struggles between the chillings, <laughs> mm -hmm. post ice ages, as they face 2012. If Africans have left this planet. And going to other planets, then are the other mother's planes or starship bodies waiting for the right time to come back so they can have a decent conversation <laughs> with their cousins? <laughs> or they, they, they got, they got it, they in the oven, man. They got cook up a little while when they tow up right now, man. They, you know how that is. <laughs> Every hundred thousand years, they go through that little flip, man, and they get towed up, man. Were they the ones who were left behind? Mm -hmm. Or what? Are there ones amongst us who are high priests who know this? And their job is to protect and to preserve the human family, even as it goes through these things. Where, where are they? Are they inside of us? So one of the cataclysmic change is, in my book, a certainty. Mm. An earthquake hit nine ain't no joke. Mm. It's a sign of the times. Mm. I've never heard of a nine earthquake. Mm. I've never heard of that. Never heard of that at all. I'm living over in L.A. I'm living over an earthquake site. <laughs> They say that half of California wants to drop off in the ocean. <laughs> oh, man. 
when that moment comes, I hope I'm ready. But I won't be ready. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! I've been in some shakers, man, and hey, you know, when they hit, I was in San Francisco in 1992. I was sitting in my patience on my good friend, Dr. Jay Crawford. We were discussing some things that he was going through, and suddenly the walls began to crack. I could hear the nails popping off the wall. Oh, man, what is this? You did come to this last for a second, but then when it, oh, and it builds up some more to keep on going. I jumped up and ran down the stairs, trying to run outside. And Jake ran up and I went, man, who was standing in the doorway? Say, stand in the doorway, hell, brother, I'm getting up out of here. Trying to fly out the door. And then it stopped. But then every 10 minutes, aftershock. And it was funny how the people were acting. Black and white was getting along good then. <laughs> Everybody, hey, I'm so glad to have survived. But at the same time, it was a, it was a, it was a false bravado, you know. Everybody was acting all hip with it. We were scared as hell. <laughs> and it was not until I took a flight out of San Jose two days later, going back east. That you know, I was living back in North Carolina. I noticed I, my mind could then relax because I was on automatic vigilance. You, you don't, you just don't, you never let your head, you never completely relax. You can't sleep. You got to be ready to jump up any minute because it'd be the next one to jump at all. So I think that is a great thing that's happening. So when you watch that go off in Japan, usually it goes around in a circle, it goes right along the mountain range. That runs all the way through Alaska, all the way through North America, down to South America, down at the tip. Mm -hmm. There's a circle of fire. Mm -hmm. So that's a, I think, a pretty much a certainty. Mm -hmm. And uh, and the uh, the other one is that they, they speak of that the photon belt is a giant black hole. It is a black mm -hmm. hole the size of millions of our suns that are, at a certain time our Earth will enter the photon belt we get a direct blast. Now the last time that happened was several years ago in which the Earth got a direct input of a solar flare from the sun. And you know what happened? It snowed in once. Mm -hmm. The hail came down so thick it was like a layer of snow on the ground. Mm -hmm. All in the span of six hours. It was just a wall of water came out of the sky, and and I said, "Well, I said, what? Do you, I said, what does Watts have to do with it?" <laughs> <laughs> but again, you, you don't you don't know how you fit into the cosmic scheme of things. You think that this your African nationalism is a little another people just trying to get free. No, this is a fundamental chapter of the page of human of of nature's unfoldment. This is nature's story. So the, the, the chosen people have been kept thrown into slavery and been bamboozled and, and trickified. And here they are, they got a great mission to resurrect themselves and then to launch themselves again in space and pass this life seed, share it on a cosmic plane. And to look back on this moment in time and to ask, what was it like then? And when, where will we where will we be a hundred thousand years from now? Will we be around here and around here with little burnt out cats? <laughs> or will we be on another plane? That's that's a question. But the but the Mayans and then they to put that in perspective, the Mayans were a product of the Omex. And the Omex were a product of the Africans coming out of West Africa, the Knox civilization three thousand BC, if not over. From according to this Paul Alfred Barton, and according to this one here, the Omex, this one doesn't go deep. This one does. Even though he's from a university, my 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 fellow co colleague, Dr. Hafar, says he's from the College of the Sequoias. That's not no Ivy League school, but he's, he's from the Pacific 
Fresno Pacific, what the hell is that, man? But the quality of his thoughts were outstanding. So I judge a work by his reference list and by the quality of his thoughts. This book is entitled A History of the African Olmecs, Black Civilizations of America from Prehistoric Times to the Present Era. Paul Alfred Barton, B-R-T-O-N, published by, it was in First Books, Revised 730-01, First Books Library, www. One stbooks.com. So the the but I wanted to add to that for you this question of 2012. Um, so it is again notice how in the erasure of history you hear about the Omex, you hear about the Mayas, but you don't hear about the Omex. Who were the Omex? What did they have to do in African culture? What did African culture have to, what about the old Atlantis? Is there an Atlantis underneath at the ice of Antarctica? Was that an older civilization? What about the movement of people out of South Africa into South America? What about all that communication and travel? What about the movement of people out of Africa into the Americas, into Asia. Mm. Now there's an article coming out in the Journal of Science of last week that tracks the origin of human language to South Africa roughly 50,000 years ago and traces to the concept of phenomes and shows that the further you away you get away from Africa, the, more, the fewer phenomes that you have. So people living in Hawaii only had 11 with people going back towards Africa for 50 or more. Yes. It was in the Times yesterday. In the Times. And you can get the journal Science at your public library tomorrow. Okay. I mean, uh, Saturday or Sunday. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll get my, I, I subscribe to it. And that's in the, in the Times. So that's a very important piece about phenomes. And then again, it's like what kind of language modeling do you have? And then the, and there's also, a, well, uh, in the March 18th issue of Science, there's an article having to do with the cytochromes. These are, uh, and using the Drosophila fruit fly, this is really getting ticky tack off off the subject. These are certain neurons that can sense the changes going from nighttime into daytime, and they signal. They, and there's a protein. In the back of the retina, that same chem that we just looked at, called melanoprotein, which is broken off, passes into blood from your third ventricle, and brings on the signal for your being aware of a new day, and the new circadian rhythms, and how your body will then adjust and go through either increasing or decreasing its hormonal content. And so how does your body know what cycle it is going through? So we do keep track of time. Many of I've had many a patient who, on the anniversary of a parent's death, usually two months before and two months after, they go through the blues. Mm -hmm. They can feel that when that time is coming up, and they just got to go through it. They go through a, a whole review and communication and depression and sometimes more, or just spiritual contact. Yes. Um, my question has to do with the melanin in the eyes. And how does the sunlight affect that? Should you be wearing sunglasses in okay. the summertime? And also, um, what about eye operations like cataracts and okay. you know, those kind of things? No, cataracts is a condition where you don't have connective tissue for forming over the lens. Mm -hmm. And that has to do with the metabolic condition. And I'm not up on all the, I would actually talk to Dr. Uh, Lewis, who I'm certain is a much more, he's an ophthalmologist as well as a scientist on the immune system, you know, without question. Dr. Lewis will give you a detailed, most helpful discussion on that one. 
Yeah, but 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 anyway, coming back to it, but back coming back to it, the uh, what I have noticed, at least in my own practice, the issue of toxins and poisons that as he so aptly talks about is of the, of great importance. The the issue of eating nutrient foods that are rich in green, dark green content, so you can get much more in the way of proper nutrition, is the utmost importance. The issue of uh, the issue of light, because I I'm, I have a bit of as I grow older with age, I have a, a problem seeing things at a distance, but I've been blessed with good close vision still. And so I and I know my brother, who's not a vegetarian, has that problem. He has he has problem reading close up, mm -hmm. and at a distance. So I would think he's been. Eating too many Johnny's pastrami's, <laughs> which he always sends me out and wants me to bring back to it. But the, uh, but more more to the point, the uh, there is a lot that can be said about the about vision and the need to maintain good vision. Now the Anu Kant's word a uh, hieroglyph for vision is two circles represented with two eyes and it means I see to see so again you can see with any sensory portal you can see with your eyes you can see with your nose you can see with your ears you can see with your touch you can see with other things as well uh, but that is that is of the utmost importance uh, and how do you the straining of the eyes the resting of the eyes it used to be back in the day I was fired up young brother and I would four hours all I need, man. I can go to sleep two hours, wake up and forward, keep on cruising. Well I've since learned that ain't so. <laughs> <laughs> the body has on many occasions just sit your little butt down, fella. <laughs> and just sit here and talk today when I came, Sister Kelp was kind of to host me. I came in five nineteen, I said, Sister Kelp, well I'll see you. <laughs> I couldn't even hold a conversation. And I woke up, goodness, it must have been about uh, 11 or almost 12 before I could even get going. It felt so good to relax. Mm -hmm. So getting proper rest and that recharging of your batteries. Now it is very, very true in terms of the immune system that the getting periodic rest is of the utmost importance. There's all kinds of sleep, but a good sleep and a good rest where you can recharge. The mind does heal itself and we get it. We energize itself during times of sleep. And it is very important when you sleep, turn all lights off. Turn all lights off. Turn all music off. Just have silence. Now, I don't know about the smell. The smell to me is kind of, I guess I'm maybe going to include all external sensory stimulants. So you can then go for internal sensory stimulants. But I'm not quite about that, but that, those are also very good parameters to, 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 to operate upon. Uh, what, what have you noticed about your, your, your vision? As long as I take my, um, my eye vitamins, yes. it's okay. It's good. What vitamins do you take for your eye vitamins? I take them um, after you from the vitamin shop. Okay. And what are you eating your and what are you eating your nutrition for vitamins? For your vitamin A or Well, I'm vegetarian and I take a bunch of supplements every day. Okay, so you are you're strong on the carrots then, huh? That's when I do my fast, I do okay. carrots. Okay. Yeah. yeah, so those those are great. Those are great. Let's see no, where no, we're no, that's okay. Yeah. I'd like to tell uh, my story was just happened with me recently. And I, I you just named the uh, uh, many psychosis and neurosis, and I'm hoping that's not my case. Oh, well. <laughs> but I have been going through the last few months uh, discoloration in my <coughs> face, and at one point I was totally two toned, and I was trying to get an appointment with a dermatologist in Brooklyn. They said it's the best. His name is Michael Jackson. Mm. But it was like a three month waiting list. Man, man. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. So my doctor recommended that I go to downstate hospital 
because they had a good um, clinic there, and I would probably be able to, because Michael Jackson's on duty there as yeah. well, mm -hmm. and he gave me a reference to go, and I went, and uh, a little blonde doctor came to me, and uh, she looked into my face, and she asked me what was the problem. So I told her, I said, can't you see? My face is totally discolored, which it was. This part of it was very light. The other part was dark like my hand. And um, she said, I said that I'm dealing with a severe case of discoloration. Mm -hmm. And I like to find out what could be the problem so that you know I can resolve this. It's been going on now for about a month. It's getting worse and worse. So she said to me, well, what I will do is put you through a battery of tests, and um, then she said to me, what we will do is process also of elimination. So I asked her what kind of tests was she speaking about. So she says, but you know what, I'm looking in your face. There's nothing wrong. You're so beautiful. What is the problem? You don't like being lighter? Then I realize I'm in the wrong place. I realize, the wrong place. So you really I said politely, thank you very much. And I, I just left. Well, that, that, that illustrates the problem. Yes, yeah, she had no idea about melanin, and because I then said to her that, uh, we were my friends here, I told her about this. Um, I told her, no, I'll, I want my beautiful black melon yes. back, you know, and um, yeah. I don't think this is where I'll get any help, thank you. Yeah, she and was, I just left and never returned. Yeah, she was asking for the wrong thing. She but I thought that, because that, Dallas State is a learning hospital, and I was assuming that uh, they would then start testing me for all kinds of nonsense, whatever would benefit them. But, but, as, but as you point out, it is likely to be know. biased. No, it's Dr. Michael Jackson. He's what FHC? He's, he's supposed to be black. I've never met him. I well, have. hopefully you will have a different, a different perception. <laughs> no, I've been treating myself and is working itself out. What treatments have worked for you? I don't know. I started eliminating. I, I have a health uh, situation, so I'm on medications. So I began to eliminate one for a while and mm -hmm. see what would happen, different foods and just what she suggested in the end. I've been doing it myself. Yes. And it's evening out. The itching is all gone. And um, so I just live with it. But that, that's critical. You point out the itching as an inflammatory response. Mm -hmm. And then the lightning could have been a part of the inflammatory response as well. Yeah. Many people have inflammatory responses that of getting dark. But it also can be that of getting lighter as well. Yeah, we well, have decreased blood flow as blood flow is being closed off to certain areas, it's in spasm because there's certain kind of things that may get in the way. But again, I would encourage you to talk to our good friend, Dr. Lewis. <laughs> you know? Which I did. And so I... Well, he has me on my protocol. Oh, right. And you see the positive results. Yeah, well, I've been just <coughs> taking the same protocol he's given me for the last 15, 13 years. Oh, yeah. Work its way out, but uh, just to say that a big learning institution like that wouldn't have any other suggestion for me other than I think they were going to use me as a guinea pig. Well, I, when I was talking to Dr. Lewis just last night, he said some things that clearly, as a fellow physician, reminded me to just how primitive things still are. Regardless, primitive in terms of <coughs> people being possessed by ignorance and fear that makes them ask the wrong questions and close critical doors, wrong answers. So that the fact that this person would dare assume that you were trying to get whiter was a crazy notion that reflects her own insanity and her own miseducation. You don't want to look like me? Yeah, what yeah. You, yeah. you know, I, remember I went time to a, a dentist, and I was having some orthodontic work done, and he came and told me I was working too hard. And I'm saying, I'm trying to save my people. What you talking about working too hard? And he presented this model of, you know, kick back, doing all of this. 
I'm saying that's that's nothing with somebody who is a a victim who doesn't know the time of history that we're in. I said, no, I don't want to sit up there and drink champagne with your tired butt. I dang, I don't want to be chasing your women. I don't want your drugs. No, and that don't, that don't appeal to me at all. Where's the mission? Where's the spirit? Where do I? But coming back to what well, also you're saying though is the is that the uh, that Dr. Lewis made known uh, in the rush for wealth, quick wealth, and this dime a dozen, uh, you know, you just pay me. I'll put in an appearance here, and you'll pay me five hundred thousand dollars, and you get. Incorporated into that kind of that kind of scene, that kind of uh, capitalist venture that one guy on the top makes a billion, mm -hmm. the other guys, few of them make millions, and everybody else makes pennies. Mm -hmm. that, that kind of profit distribution approach to the service product mm -hmm. is wrong. You're doing it because you're trying to find out what is this person's, what did they put here by the spirit, God, to do. And how do you assist them in fulfilling their mission on, in life? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, when, when you get that kind of approach, then you got a beautiful thing going on. But if it's just profit-driven, blind profit, no, he, he's, brother, he's just trying to, he's about to work and do that work thing, man. That's okay, man. It's not okay, but I've, I've done the same, man, many a time. But, but the, but I, you know, I, 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 I've seen that, and like I was saying, the, the amount of fear that goes out in terms of people being afraid to look at blackness mm -hmm. in its own profound, profound way, and the immense to erase history and to minimize all of the African contributions to world everything is just profound. And I can recall one, and this is a little side note, one guy was, he was a professor at this school I was attending, UC San Francisco Berkeley's Med School. And he was the head of uh, a, one of the big ways in psychiatry. And he talked about his library that he'd accumulated, but he never had time to read. Mm -hmm. I look back at him and say, you're tragic, man. I am taking time to read and how important that is and don't you feel something missing from you that you never did that you took the profit motive and you didn't take the spirit motive how incomplete do you feel I have two sons that I wish I had spent more time with them in introducing them into the medical realm early on when they were little babies but I was too busy worrying about other things that I thought the most important things were right in front of me. It was your immediate family, you know. So that lady who was asking you that, without even taking a guess, she probably is a typical resident raised through trying to get her a little piece of the cake. And not and losing sight of the children that she's raising, losing sight of her choice of a mate, losing uh, she's as as uh, Dr. who was also saying, who's going to determine that she becomes an associate or a full professor if she doesn't belong to the right old boy or old, old girl's club? Will she get sidetracked by that? So, but glad to hear things are going better for you. So let me. Other questions? I, 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 I'm going to go on and on. They said I had all night. So. <laughs> but let's let's take the uh, oh, the one the let's see. Here's a question here. Uh, in this here, for example, is the introduction from the utterance 639 from the Pyramid Text. Now this is written 3,200 years B.C., 5,200 years ago. O oh, Wosir the king, take the eye of the living Haru that you may see with... This is on page 127. O 
old will sear the king. Take the eye of the living who rule that you may see with it. O will sear the king, may your vision be cleared by the means of the light. That your vision will be cleared by the light. O will sear the and I also <coughs> want to say this. When you hear these words, it is so important to get a dictionary and a big, if you can, a big reference dictionary and a um, and, a, and another book that will show you what these, when you go into the etymology of a word, that's extremely important. So what does vision mean? That your vision may be cleared. Oh, well, sir, may your vision be brightened by the dawn. It's going to be brightened by the dawn. Oh, well, sir, the king, I give you the eye of Uru when Ra gives it. Oh, well, sir, the king, I put forth to you the eye of Uru that you may see with it. So to imagine yourself seen with an eye that was as bright as the dawn, to look to things of new discovery. So you can go back to your condition and say, I've gone, my body has gone through an ordeal. And I have ended up triumphant. I had negative forces were trying to pull me down and trying to take my health from me. And I've been blessed with a recovery. So you're going through a night sea journey, so to speak. And then to take in, in, in your dream diary to write down what images come to you. And you may find that there may be images of the uplifting mode, of the transcendent mode, of the struggle mode. And they be very, very valuable for you. And it's and then it, and I was just going through this book here, uh, Nicholas, for example, and some of these references. Nicholas, if you were to ask me, give me the one author who has the most concise chemical physics review of melanin, I would cite Nicholas. This is an Italian chemist, and his name. is he wrote an article for example biological garbage or jewels a scientific communication presented at the meeting of the european society for Pigment cell research in 1968 and then he wrote another one entitled and there's several speculating on the banned colors in nature so they're looking at melanin as it appears in other biological systems, be it plant or animals. Do you know melanin is a living organic molecule found in interstellar stellar space? There are biological organisms in interstellar gas clouds. Dream at night when you're sleeping, or is it just that you don't remember? Well, it's just what, what have you experienced, my sister? I don't, I don't dream. Okay, I, what's, what's part I, mean, of this? I can only remember three dreams in my entire life. Oh, excellent. Oh. Then be my patient for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Let me sit back now. Hold on. <laughs> and what was the, what were those three dreams? One, I remember specifically walking through a, a, a big field with just green, green everywhere, holding the hands of both of my grandfathers but Ooh. one was deceased at Ooh. this particular time. Ooh. And this dream was so pleasant. I never forgot it. Never forgot it. I, I seemed to be happy because my grandfather's loved all. You know, my grandfather yeah, dear daddy, and yeah, loved us all. <laughs> that dream I never forgot. Um, as a kid, I always dreamt I was flying. The bed flew out the window. That was a recurring dream okay. as a kid. Look our way. Here's a super genius, gifted artisan being told she should be content to take that $7.28 job and be content with it. Don't ask those questions. Those are ridiculous questions. Girl, you know, you just, just do what I tell you to do. Be happy with it. All those put down kind of things can weigh upon us. 
and limit us. And I'm here to say, loose yourself. Realize you've been the victim of propaganda. <laughs> and with you... So that would, that would suppress dream? Yeah. Because of, um, See, when, you, when, you, when, you're, when you're waking up, you're coming back into Americana. <laughs> Let me get ready. Yes, I'm trying to get paid, Joe. Yes, yeah, yeah. Don't put me in jail. Yeah. I'm not no terrorist. Yeah. I'm not no wild hoochie coochie girl. And all that stuff. <laughs> all that stuff yeah. you know. yeah. I'm good granddaddy's good girl, you know. Yeah. I'm good people. <laughs> I don't have no great rage for no people who jack my people, or do I? <laughs> you should hear what my family calls me. What do they call you? Oh, ter oh, oh um, they swear my phone is tapped because <laughs> everybody's listening in on Joyce. I mean, for what? If somebody's listening in on me, I, like I always say, they can kiss my black egg. I'm not doing yeah, there you go. Illegal. There you go. I'm not doing anything illegal, so if somebody wants to listen to my phone conversations, fine. But my family members think that. I may be causing them some problems yeah, because they're they related to me. Exactly. Um, so you hear, you hear how that family can be <laughs> living. That's part of the, that, as you say, my brother, that's part of that propaganda. That's part of the community fear that we all live with. I gave a lecture one time at a National Medical Station conference, and the brother on podium that was a minister from a big church told me, man, you better be quiet. You can get killed talking like that. I wanted to tell him so bad. Well, hey, you tell the audience that, brother. Hey, man, don't sit up here and flip out on me. You know, hey. But the, but the fear factor, so the, that's one, is the fear of retaliation by the famous, nefarious, whatever. They, whoever they are. Whoever they are. Devil gonna get you. Devil gonna get you. There's, but then... Notice that dream that you had of walking through the fields. Now, when I had uh, Dr. Jeffries back there, he has these, Dr. Jeffries is working on this technum and all these monuments in Sudan. And whenever I see that sister, that brother and his sister, man, they always come through there, man, with mind-boggling new stuff. <laughs> Just take you way past that. So she wrote a new book, and I'm praying that she will publish the book, Dr. Jeffries. <laughs> so... <laughs> and I'll get it out because everybody needs it. And so they, they talk about the, the totem for Netter is that of a flag with a, a pole with a flag on it, just blowing in the breeze. And the divine, the great God, is that vast. It is the wind that we cannot see or hear, but permeates all things. It is the breath of life. Mm -hmm. So you had an experience in which you were seeing the infinite great works of your God, our God, the divine most high, in which your grandfather was a part of. And guess who else was a part of that? Joyce is. Joyce is. So you have that kind of backup. Yeah, they got some devils out there, but you got them showing up got some backup. You got some backup. Yeah, the ancestors. The ancestors yeah. working with you. Yeah. So, and this is, I'm not to make light of it because it's, it's a scary thing to wake up. My dreams come in spurts. Sometimes they come, sometimes they're gone. And sometimes they come and I say, wow, I don't even want to get up and face this down. I want to stay in that. Let's keep seeing that. But we're never alone. And so I think that you know, there is a conditioning, there's a lot of conditioning trying to make Africans to not listen, to not see. To listen to that quiet inner voice, is that what you're talking about? Listen. Be it quiet or not so quiet. Uh -huh. Be it, especially the quiet, because sometimes it's like a whisper. You know, it's like, you think, oh man, was that? It can't be like that, but it won't go away. It won't, it won't leave you alone. It keeps, like a little kid pulling on your coattail. Come back. Check this. Check what? I told anyone, let's do it. I say keep checking it. <coughs> and when, the, when you do, oh, look at it. It just flows over you. And to watch your emotional highs that come to you 
once you open those doors. The blessings come as an emotional uplift. You get your payment in elevated feeling tones. Yes. So, yeah. want a break? Yes. Yes, we, we should take a break now for those who can get around. Okay, and spell phenotones, how are you spelling it? I know for, it's a pH word. Oh, fail melon or, 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 or phenone, P-H-E-O-N-O-M-E-S, fail gnomes. This is in, in, the art, in checking the ancestry of languages. Let's take a break so people have a chance to share. There's a lot of them. We've got um, uh, chaos and... Um, <laughs> Wind and whatnot going on outside, but there's a lot of peace and in here. I can, coming up from 145th and walking in here, there's a whole nother world here. So we're glad our brother is still with us. Glad we are too. Because he was stepping up into glory. He said, No, I'm not ready now. And so he's back with us. And uh, so we need to appreciate our moments with him, not just now, but in, in previous circumstances. I'm working on my taxes now, so that means I'm looking for things, et cetera, so grab one, one something to pull it up, and, and, uh, and it was um, the partner of Mother Kepler, Bill Jones. It's a transcript that our brother Adisa did of Jacob Carruthers oh, man. coming to the first world in 1985. Man. In 1985, he had been there in 84, but he said he didn't feel comfortable. So he was glad to come back. And now he felt at home, mm -hmm. at peace. Because in 84, we had the idea of ASCAC. And we met in Chicago, and uh, we met in Los Angeles to have that family coming together. And then we decided to mobilize and organize ourselves for power. And so that happened in 85. And Jay Carruthers took the leadership from Alana Karanga, and he incorporated ASCAS around his sense of spirituality. Mm -hmm. And so he felt secure coming to New York, because this is rough. You come to New York, you better have your security together mm -hmm. uh, in all kinds of ways. So he came spiritually on to deal with New York. So he was glad to be invited back. And so he's being introduced by Brother Bill Jones <laughs> at the top of his game when he was trying to control the world. <laughs> and the only force against him was Mother Kepler. <laughs> <laughs> she kept him grounded in humanity. But his whole thing was to manipulate and to push us into an African consciousness. Mm -hmm. So the statement that was read about what the first world was, and his introduction to Jacob Carruthers was extraordinary. I'm trying to make a copy of this before you read it. Uh, you leaving tomorrow early? Uh, 6.30 p.m. Okay. So it's time for me to make a copy. But the beauty of it is, here's Jacob Carruthers, a spiritual force among us, coming to help get ASCAC organized. After it was incorporated, it needed to have another strength and essence. And so he was saying, we started something in Los Angeles, we continued it in Chicago. Now the baton is being passed on to New York. And since he is the leader of the organization, New York is the next stage of its development. And he came to challenge New York to push it even further. And we did. We said we're going to have a conference like no other conferences. And it occurred at City College. And if the key factors in the City College triumphed, was Dr. <coughs> and Mary Lewis, Arthur and Mary said that we're going to do something Yay. different. Yay. We're going to do something different. Instead of having a normal conference, and the reason why black folks can't do what they need to do in terms of mobilizing resources is because we are imitating white folks. 
we, ha we have a gathering, and then we spend all our money to look good at a banquet. They said we're going to have a banquet because we need to celebrate, but it's going to be a different banquet. And I, we decided we have it at City College, and they decided they would prepare the food. And as a result of that, generated at that conference was $55,000. At least half of that money was given to the new organization because we didn't spend it on the banquet. We spent it on ourselves. And that new organization in 86 was birthing an idea that we don't just have a normal uh, coming together. We have a family spiritually coming together. And in 86, when we met, we said, we're going to the Nile. And I'll be damned if we didn't go to the Nile. And who went to the Nile with us? Dr. Richard King. Yeah. Mm. Dr. Ray Nobles. Regent Accolade Sanford. Yeah. Daniel Arthur. Yeah. And, and a host of us. Yeah. Idea of birth. Given a foundation in Chicago spiritually. Given another sense of power and purpose and mission in New York. And then a thousand people went to the Nile. I had three generations. My mother, my wife and I, my nephews. 13 and 14 year old Hassan and Hafiz. So it's about a spiritual process. As that process developed for the mind is continuing as our uh, New York regional, uh, Eastern Regional President reminds us we're going to go up to Boston at the end of the month. October. This is, this is the October. October. Going up to Boston. At the end of this month, April the 30th, there's a lot of activity going on. The next day, we're going on a bus pilgrimage to the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, where the most significant Nubian collection in America is. And so, no, it's not going to be interesting. It's going to be very spiritually correct. But Boston is, is, the, is one of the centers of European materialism, just like New York is the center of world materialism. So we're going to leave it to go up to Boston to deal with the spirituality that comes out of Nubia and connect it to the spirituality of Kevin. And that's the experience that I had a, a, a few years ago um, when this young brother, Taki, said, Dr. J, I want you to go to Nubia. Nobody goes to Nubia. Now, Dr. Ben used to go, got lost, etc. But Taki is hooked up spiritually with Nubia because his wife, his former wife, is from Nubia. So they were, we had a fantastic spiritual, spiritual presence. And that's what Richard is talking about. As we, as I'm reaching for some material stuff to do my tactics, I said, what is this? And they, all of a sudden, here is something called lecture, comedic melanin, projections on the Kabbalah and the Kabaja. Pan-African, cross-cultural analysis and speculations using Dogon, Yoruba, Ashanti, Christian, and Islamic comparisons by R.R. Jeffries, Ph.D. art historian. This is something that Rosalind forgot that she did. Man. This is when we were in the early phases Man. of looking at these things coming at us, and she's making comparisons, etc., etc. She's grown past this. And so uh, I forgot that she did it. But again, this is, these are things we need to piece together and try to connect because we're really on the vanguard of an African consciousness, and most of our people are going in the other way, and so we have to keep going on the right mission. So what our sister is saying is that there will be a regional conference in Boston, uh, October the 14th to the 16th, at the University of Massachusetts, Boston, hosted by the African Studies Department, and uh, so that you can plan if you wish and have the resources to go with us, said he wanted to come. I said, this is the worst possible time to come, simply because Mother Kef is trying to get herself stabilized, uh, having lost her partner. Uh, Sister Sybil William Clark is uh, trying to deal with some health challenges, but she still maintains her spiritual mission. And uh, Dr. Rousey Jeffries, mm has been in trouble this last week. Oh, no. Uh, you know, health-wise, yeah. whatever is happening. Mm -hmm. And uh, Brother Smalls, uh, <laughs> 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 Brother Smalls 
and I are getting ready to get out of here. He's leaving tomorrow for Africa. I'll be following him. We can't go on the same plane, so we're going one day after. But we'll be doing some business around Ghana uh, for a week, and then we'll be back here. Um, now, the reason why I mention all those, including Sister Claudia, who was ready to come, uh, but when the storm started hitting hard and people are dealing with their personal crises, uh, they backed away. So this brother came in the storm. He set us on our course in terms of melanin and, and the rest of it. And so we need to show him some love. It would be good to come and greet him, purchase a book, and leave, but we need to show him some love. All of you all have put organizations and institutions together. This building here is a story mm. in and of itself. Yes. The Lewis. It's true. And their attempt to raise up Dr. Ben, because we got mm. Dr. Clark House right up the hill. This was supposed to be Dr. Ben House. Mm. Now, Brother Reggie left to go get Dr. Ben. Mm. So it would be good for those of us who have to leave to hang a little bit, maybe another 15 or 20 minutes, and maybe Dr. Ben will, will come. Now, I see one of my Capricorn brothers. Unbelievable. He said he'd been waiting since 2 o'clock today in the lobby. How are you, sister? Oh, I'm okay. And you? Good to see everyone. When did it come into being, and who were the organizers of First World? Um, we came into being in the late 70s, mm -hmm. and the organizers was Brother Bill Jones, Brother Sam Dupree, Sister Viola Dupree, Brother Al Moore, Reverend Frederick Douglas, Kurt Patrick, and myself. Yeah. Um, what, what was what was your mission? Your, have a mission. Well, when we when we first started talking about it, we weren't sure what we were going to be able to do in the African community. We wanted to do some work in the community. So we weren't sure exactly how to go about it. So when we found Dr. Ben on 125th Street, we spoke to him about it. And he told us how we should go about it. And that's what happened. What is your most fun memory of First World? Oh, I think it may have been going to Egypt for the first time. Mm -hmm. I tell you, I was truly blown away by that trip. Uh -huh. What impressed you most with the trip? Well, actually, all the things that we had been studying with Dr. Ben about, when we got there, he was able to show us, and we saw that with our own two eyes. And that was very, to me, seeing is believing, that's very impressive. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Looking at things psychologically, uh, why is it so difficult for, for black parents and the black community to get black youth to pull their pants up from around their butt? Why is it down there? What, what, what is the psychological manipulation? I think it is a statement 
of it's a statement of uh, opposition. There's fear in their hearts because they have not been prepared to enter into the schizophrenic world of white supremacy. They're being told that everything is all right. They want a quick fix to make a lot of money. But they haven't woke up to what education is all about, what having a skill is all about. And, and that though they, they see a few examples of athletes and celebrities, one out of a million getting over for a few years, the reality is that most people don't have that kind of success. But so the question comes, how do we build strong black families? How do we have educational systems that really find our true calling? And how do we prepare people to be certain to build a strong black community? And the white educational system is, doesn't want strong black education. They don't want them to read Dr. Ben's book, Phrenology of the Bible. <laughs> At all. When I heard Dr. Ben give a lecture, how in 1942 on a steamship over to Egypt and had to sleep on the banks of the Nile and look out for the crocodiles. Because they couldn't even give they wouldn't even give him a place in the hotel to do his work and to do his scholarship. And yet this groundswell now is undergoing with people are waking up a little bit. And yet these people are still trying to roll the clock back. It's it's quite a it's quite a drama. Now I, I take it that people have a genetic memory of what the truth is sometimes. And to the degree that they're ignored, they'll become more rebellious. Because you know, something's missing in this script. You know, when I asked my son to try to go back and reassert black things, the youngest one, he's caught by confusion. Even though I'm trying to be a living example of it, he's caught by white friends acting all right trying to tell him that he should not be angry at them. And I was so pleased here the other day, Dr. Doctor of Family, when your minister asked you why you came to church, and you told him because you wanted the music, and she asked him if you were racist, he said, yeah, like everybody else. <laughs> that kind of truth. In 1985, we had a Nile Valley conference. And Dr. Ben said correctly, if any of y'all goes there, you ain't no friend of mine. So none of us can go. But the truth was, we were trying to not offend white educators. Right. We can't get caught up in that. We got to stand with things that benefit our people. And no, they have not told the truth. No, it will blur the boundaries. No, you need to remember all the pain that our people have gone through, through the slavery. You can't escape from that kind of rage. It makes you a flaky, shaky, false person. You gotta be true to, to it. I mean, you gotta get up and knock somebody out every day, but you're gonna be vigilant that it not repeat itself. Because in no way is white supremacy stopped. The propaganda, I live in, I live in LA. The center of propaganda. Hollywood. Hollywood. And they put these images out. They're totally false. Totally false. Not even historically correct at all. And they're very sensitive to the doing so. So I think the children's thing about letting their pants drop and looking as if they want to be play, playing like that. I I saw the other day, I saw Doc, a sister who was walking around with her pants dropped. She had suspenders on, she had her pants dropped down below her, who was she had on? She didn't have no male panties or uh, drawers on, but she has another kind of drawers on, like two layers of drawers so it wouldn't see through. I said, I am seeing everything now. Let's see, so walk around with her pants dropping. 
That's what I thought. She looked like she could be. Yeah, the spindle. Yeah, because you have the... You have the... the Take it off. Put that out. He's heard. He's heard, but that's why he won't bring it to New York. <laughs> She's going to be on the show Monday. She might have a sister. And I may, I may disappear on Tuesday. <laughs> if you disappear, we don't know why. <laughs> now, how long have you known Michelle? <laughs> As I told Sister Hyatt and Dr. Lewis, I had put in my retirement papers, so I will be retiring as of June the 30th of this year. From where? From the College of New Rochelle. From America. <laughs> Why you got a Marine Corps shirt on? <laughs> It's a gang I used to belong to to keep me safe. <laughs> um, I'll be moving to Uganda. Um, yes. Um, this university there called Uganda Martyrs University. I was there last year on sabbatical and had submitted a proposal for an African studies program with the university that was rejected. Oh. Rejected. And oh, I'm sorry to hear that. as a result, one of the faculty members will be establishing a branch campus in a city called Mbarara, and he asked me to come and begin the African Studies program right. at that campus. Right. 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 Don't play. So that will be taking place. There are some community activities that we're going to be doing as well, an after-school program, adult education program, and bringing goods and supplies to wonderful, orphans. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, I have about 50 boxes of clothes from students from the college, um, books, uh, our friends at the New York City Board of Education. Uh, have been involved in the process when you change commissioners. Mm -hmm. The commissioners change the contracts for securing supplies. Mm -hmm. So they are throwing away books. Mm -hmm. They're throwing away laptops mm -hmm. uh, and made an agreement with one of the um, administrators there to donate books, supplies, and 30 laptops uh, for the community-based program. Mm -hmm. um, so and they want to establish a, a long-term program so that uh, at some point, middle school students will be able to come over for the summer to come to Africa and vice versa. Wonderful. Uh, so there's a principal at PS203 in Brooklyn that is very conscious. Uh, hopefully the new uh, Mr. Ed. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Mr. Ed. <laughs> Hopefully, he won't stop. I didn't. That's what's reported in the newspaper. I didn't call him that. Did they call him Mr. Ed? Maybe well, we know about who Mr. Ed was. A talking horse. <laughs> right. So. Um, Bloom Bucks. Bloom Bucks. Bloom Bucks. But again, that. <laughs> July 30th, I'll be on the plane and I will come back when my daughters graduate high school, when they graduate college, and when they get married. Uh, and they will have to come over to visit. Uh, but that's that. Um, two, two questions. Now I would be so proud. Two questions. Um, who was the, in one of the individuals that initiated your contact with the Ugandan uh, so, uh, country. Brother Nana. Nana mm -hmm. with Turkey. Oh. Mm -hmm. uh, was him. We were supposed to go to a conference together and he just said, come on, come on, let's go, let's go, let's go. Uh, on the eve of us going together, um, he had some family difficulties. He couldn't come. Yes. Uh, Brother Brown came to Jersey, dropped off some materials. Um, that was in 2004. Um, yes, 2004, because he died in 2005. And it was supposed to be an international Pan-African conference. Um, unfortunately, there were more Europeans there than Africans. Um, 
but it worked out all right because I got to meet some people and establish some relationships, uh, and that has been an ongoing thing that has been taking place in 2004 to the present. Um, I thought I might want to stay there, so I was able to make arrangements to secure a sabbatical. Uh, so I was able to be on the ground for 13 months and see some things, make some better connections. Um, now it's the place to go. That's the place the to live. The question is, uh, what work will you be doing with the Toi? Yes. That's, with the Batois, I will continue some research that I have begun, um, and that is looking at their contributions to early African civilization and culture. Uh, I had heard somebody speak, I think it was 1978, it was Dr. Yosef Ben something. <laughs> <laughs> And the first I'd ever heard of the Twa was from this man right there. Yes, sir, Doc. Yes, sir. I consider myself one of his students. Yeah. Um, what did you say, Doc? There you go. Get that. Clips it. Get that. Put that on. What do you say, Doc? I can't say much. Doc got on me one day. He said, don't ever say anything about African gods unless you're going to mention African goddesses. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. That's right. That's Dr. Finn. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Right. Uh, and uh, Brother okay, Larry, so, uh, uh, Gray, he's uh, working with you guys as, as we speak. Charles he's there, he's there now? He has come back, but okay. he's been there for several months. He's trying to work on several important things. Okay. What specifically are you trying to tie in the Twa to? What are you going to be doing as your lifetime, one of your lifetime projects as it relates to the Patois? Um, raising them up. In terms of, one thing is let them speak for themselves. Exactly. Let them tell their own story. Uh, that's going to be very important. Um, they're looked down in society mm -hmm. in Uganda. Mm -hmm. I, I remember being at a faculty me meeting and uh, was asked, well, what are you, why are you here? What are you going to do? And I mentioned that I wanted to uh, examine the role that the Batois played in um, traditional African civilization and culture, people laughed. Mm -hmm. And these are faculty members, mm -hmm. so they don't know. Mm -hmm. um, but what, what we do know is that the Patois have been moved out of the forest. Mm -hmm. um, they only can go back with government representatives mm -hmm. because they, the forests are now set aside for European tourists mm -hmm. to come look at gorillas and all this kind they of stuff. With the gorillas and uh, but the Batois, out. they want to go to the forest, <laughs> not only to get honey, but that's where their medicine is. Mm -hmm. You know, their traditional yes, medicines are in the forest. Um, they banded together with, they have an organization connected with Uganda, Rwanda, and Burundi. Um, and they found out that they have some similar concerns amongst all these three different areas and the DRC. Excuse me. Um, and the organizations that they've established, now they're looking for aid and assistance that's not coming from the government. Uh, so that um, the work that will begin now with the books and the clothing and uh, attempting to market their crafts um, will be something that will be an inroad to having people accept you. They're very leery of strangers, and when I visited, of course, I was a stranger because I'm 6'3", and people um, were short of stature. Four, two. Uh, <laughs> but that story in terms of their movement from the Great Lake region up to Kemet and the contributions that were made uh, going north, Going east, going south, going west, that is another story that needs to be told as well, that the people from this region would populate the rest of the world uh, and bring uh, aspects of African culture and civilization to other parts around the world. 
Uh, that story hasn't been told yet either, uh, not in any great detail. Other people have focused around the edges and have talked about some things, whether that be Renoko Rashidi in terms of the African presence in early Egypt and then Sertima's work, talking about people coming to uh, South America and the Caribbean, uh, people going north into Europe as well as to India, China, and Japan. That story of this dispersal of African people cannot be told without mentioning and talking about the Batois. Uh, so that story will be the, the basis of why I'm there. Um, and I anticipate it probably is going to take about 10 years to finally put, you know, pull all that together. So that will be um, the legacy that me and my daughter will work on. Uh, she's 12 and she's consented to come with me and do that work. So by the time 10 years from now, she'll be 22, she'll be ready to go. She loves history. She loves history and she's 10 years old. The only age she gets her in history. <laughs> um, when I was with the um, African National Pioneer Movement, mm -hmm. Robert Harris taught us that the, taught that the first flag that was ever flown was the red, black, and green by the 12 people. Is that you? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Marcus Garvey, Africa. Right here, call us cooks. Robert Harris. I knew him down in Detroit, in the Caribbean. He did. He was in the. Okay. I mean, I know he's passed. But I'm just saying that was what he taught, and I was just trying to verify. What's your name? <laughs> <laughs> you got that on tape? You want to know what's going on here? Good college school, Robert Harris. Yeah, that yeah. one in the same. Pika. Well, I didn't know Pika, but I heard of him, but Robert Harris. I was what just... happened, Dr. Ben? Yeah. There was. I had my office that side of the street, and they were at, they, they used to keep the meeting that time we had Herbert Jewelers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Used to be on this side of the street, right. by the corner. And Herbert used to sell more, more, more money to the gamblers than to <laughs> the <church> jewelers. <laughs> 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 I wasn't trying to vouch for his character. I was just trying to confirm. I was just trying to confirm. This is the rap. I was just trying to confirm something that he taught. And I was just trying to find out. Do you know? Do you know if the first flag was red, black, and green, and was flown by the Fatwa people? Yeah. Is that true? With Carlos Cooks used to be had a fellow named Pika. Pika run the organization. Cooks with had a girlfriend. Pika run the organization. <laughs> and that was and her was was a jewelry store in name. Always <laughs> 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 were right on the corner. And Pika, Pika would keep up. Then he had uh, another man from the Caribbean, a sharp man, Mr. Jonathan. <laughs> 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 Cut that out, Quincy. Uh, uh, that's, my, that's my teacher. Cut that part out. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm going to save a room yourself, right? Yeah. I'll get you. Just Cut that out, right? There. To, to him was going on, and he would come there and leave. He then had white connection, mm -hmm. and Carlos Cooks was in charge of the, the, the whole thing. But these other men were under Carlos too. Mm -hmm. well, who ran the bathing, bathing suit contest? Mm -hmm. He had the girls in the bathing suits. Oh yeah. <laughs> 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 who, 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 who first flew the red, black, and green flag? Pika. Oh, Pika. 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 Oh, okay, there's your answer. Pika did it. So, let's keep moving on to the bathing suits. <laughs> <laughs> so, we, we don't know if the Twa, did the Twa have flags? I mean, who? I, 
Period. They're in That's the, the forest. Point. They were in right. the forest. Exactly. So we don't. So to have a conversation you know, we can about do flags anything. the twelve. Yeah. We don't, don't know if they were knitters. I mean, if they if they did. I don't need the flags. But they were like a nomad people. They were no matter. Yeah, that's something but you can. We, that's, that's, that's one thing we will do. Speak up, but we know speak up, that we're back to the research. But Barbados and Tutuola, we don't. We came from this next to the Virgin Islands to Saint Thomas. Saint Thomas was is by only the United States. They got it from Denmark. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, since we're on Topeka, we might as well say something about Marion Marable. So throw him under the bus, oh. too. <laughs> 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 throw him under the bus. Did <laughs> Brian Providence take care of him? Uh, oh, yeah. Marable died. Yeah. 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 But, Two but days his, before his book came out. Yeah. But his, yeah. He yeah. said in his book that Malcolm, that Malcolm was a... Um, he, he said a lot of disparaging things about Malcolm. I'm not going to mention it. That's right. But he, he worked in... Uh, a massage parlor. He said Malcolm worked in a massage parlor. What's wrong with that? A male massage parlor. Yeah. 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 Yeah, but you know what I was talking about. Yeah, I, I, I wasn't talking know. about male massages. I know, okay. All right. They did back in those times, yes. They, they've had yeah, those. Uh, Can we go back to Professor Allen <laughs> <Alan's laughs> and get <laughs> his research? And of that, that massage parlor, because massage was towards the 126th Street mm -hmm. end of the parlor. And the, 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 um, the Jewelry store was the <coughs> west end of the bar. Mm -hmm. And the boat shared the entrance in the middle. And you entered upstairs, and the second floor, where the school was, from the middle, there was a stair bed in the, uh, in the entrance. Mm -hmm. This really is